You have entered the command zone, your destination for all aspects of Elder Dragon Highlander. Enjoy your stay. How's it, everybody? Welcome back to a brand new episode of the Command Zone podcast. I'm your host, Josh Lee Kwai. I'm here with a very special co-host today. It's Rachel Weeks. Yeah, I'm so excited to be here. Thanks for having me. Yeah, thanks for coming in. So Rachel, you probably recognize because she's been on Game Nights a bunch of times. And Rachel is also a member, along with me, uh, of the Commander Advisory Group. So Rachel, you are one of the people that helps shape and guide the format. As as mu- as much as we can. Yeah, as much as as much as <laughs> which is not that much. That's that's what she means. Um, today we're gonna be talking more about Dominaria United. We're gonna do two episodes here um, about the box topper commanders yeah. from the set. This set's a little bit unique. They're doing a thing where there's a box topper pack that you get whenever you buy a booster box of any kind. So a set mm-hmm. draft collector booster. You can get one of these twenty box topper commanders, and they're all like throwbacks to old characters. They're all legendary creatures. From Legends, Yeah, right? Yeah. And they've all been designed for Commander. So a lot of really cool stuff. Yeah. Uh, These are my favorite, honestly, of the Legends in the set are these box stopper Commanders. Yeah. And you can tell because there's many, many pages of notes for us here. It's probably like nine or ten. So (laughs) strap in. It's going to be quite an episode. But before we get into it, let's talk about our sponsors. Channelfireball.com slash command is the place you want to go if you're going to buy any of this Dominary United stuff. You can order all of your booster boxes, bundles, singles. I mean, your magic players, you're going to order magic cards. You may as well use our affiliate link uh, when you do, because you'll just be getting the cards you want and supporting the content that you enjoy. Again, channelfireball.com slash command, or you can use the code, the promo code command at checkout, because I always forget to put in the affiliate link for anything. Yeah. (laughs) Uh, And then, of course, once you get your hands on the cards, you want to protect them. Ultra Pro is the game accessories brand that Jimmy and I trust our own collections to. We put all of our decks into Eclipse sleeves or maybe Guild Theme sleeves or just Ultra Pro sleeves. Play with those Satin Tower deck boxes. They really keep uh, all your cards really, really safe. We put a lot of money into these cards. You do not want them to get damaged in any way. Ultra Pro really is the best company to protect all of your game pieces. And we have an affiliate link with them now. It is ultrapro.com slash command. Of course, go to your LGS and support your LGS, you know, even to buy your Ultra Pro products and stuff when you can. But Often LGSs don't carry like every Ultra Pro product that's ever existed mm-hmm. or they're out of stuff. You know, they order and then it, they sell out. Um, the great thing about ultrapro.com slash command and buying directly from Ultra Pro is like they have all the new product. You can get it directly. You know, you're going to get it. They also have a lot of the old stuff that LGSs just don't carry anymore. I found huge discounts there, sometimes yeah. 50% plus off of things. So uh, definitely go check it out. And then, of course, the final way to support all of our content is directly if you go to patreon.com slash command zone. All kinds of cool perks for patrons. Uh, you get to watch extra turns and game nights earlier than the general public. We have a cool show called Turn Talk. We actually released one to the public. You were yes, on that episode. So fun. Yeah, it's the episode with um, all the keg members mm-hmm. and with Jim and Olivia as well. And if you want to know what Turn Talk's all about, you can check that out on our YouTube channel. But there's a bunch of those episodes that are Patreon exclusive and if you sign up for our Patreon at the right level, you would just get access to all that past exclusive content right away. So it's a lot of value right when you sign up. And there's other perks as well. Again, patreon.com slash command zone. And of course, the big perk, one of the big perks is we shout out one lucky patron every single episode. And this episode is dedicated to Scott Mon- Mandarano. Mandarano. Scott. Mandarano. Mandarano. Scott, you rock. Okay, let's get into our main topic here. This is going to be part one of a two-part series talking about the box stopper commanders from Dominator United. I kind of went over how they work earlier. You get a booster pack. Is it really a booster pack if you only get one card in it? Yeah. <laughs> okay. You still get to open it. It's true, and it is randomized, right? You, yeah, you don't know yeah. what's in there. So anytime you buy a collector's booster, a regular draft booster, or a set booster, there will be a pack with one card in it, and it will be one of these box toppers. So they do have rarity. Um, I think it's broken down. Yeah, Trev broke it down here. There are five uncommons, 10 rares, and five mythics. Um, and then, again, each of the packs only has one card in it. It is a foil version of the box toppers. And I believe you can also find, like, etched foil versions in collector's boosters packs. I believe so, yes. So the box toppers are not the only way to get these, uh, which is good because I think that would be pretty... Like, the mythics would probably be really hard to find, otherwise. be really expensive, yeah. I was glad to hear that. Yeah. So on this episode, we're going to go through the first 10 of these because there's 20. Uh, and that will be A through R alphabetically. So if you're looking for something that's after 
Well, it's, we're going to stop halfway through R. So if you're after Rasputin, it's going to be the next episode. <laughs> okay. All right. Let's start here with uh, the first one. It is Ayesha Tanaka, Armorer. Yeah. A lot of text on it. Here we go. Three white blue for a 2-4 legendary creature. Of course, human artificer. When Ayesha attacks, look at the top four cards of your library. You may put any number of artifact cards with mana value less than or equal to Ayesha's power from among them onto the battlefield tapped with the rest on the bottom of your library in a random order. Ayesha can't be blocked as long as defending player controls three or more artifacts. She is a 2-4. So with no pumping, you attack with Ayesha. You look at the top four cards and any artifact card two CMC or less onto the battlefield tapped. I can't believe they put the unblockable clause on there as well. Like this card yeah. needed that. It's like giving Winota unblockable. Evasion. Yeah. At least let, yeah. let them block and try and kill it. The big thing I w- that's different between this and Winota, because it's insane. That is the same text. Is look at cards, put it onto the battlefield. You're cheating mana. You're che- you're getting card advantage. Yeah, that's let's take one of the most effect. powerful commanders <laughs> that's been printed in like the last five years yeah. and make an artifact version of it. Okay. The big difference is at least Ayesha, Ayesha, has to be the one that attacks. <laughs> right, that's true. So, that's when, true. Winota can be triggered by things under her. So you do have to get a five drop down and you have to get her attacking. But you know what are two CMC artifacts? <laughs> yeah, a lot of the, stuff that gives haste or evasion. Yeah, Swiffle Boots and Lightning Grace. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah, so one thing I wanted to do before we get into like all the synergies and stuff is I had Truck go back and look at a bunch of game nights and extra turns episodes. Yeah. Now the sample size is kind of small because we didn't have a ton of time. Looked at about 20 games. And I, my, my question to him was like, on average, how many artifacts do players have out on turn five, let's right. say? By the tra- time I time you play I should, Yeah, exactly. And he said that, or it it was basically a 50-50 chance that a player would have at least three artifacts. Because you really, you don't care who you're attacking that much, right? No. You just need a player. So with no help, there's about a 50-50 chance she's unblockable at any given time. Right. And I mean... You don't even need her to be unblockable, right? Like a 2-4 is a decent attacking body. You just need something that's like not a good block. Right. If they just have an Oracle of Moldiah, you just like swing into it. Because what are you going right. to do? Block with your... That's fine. I'll trade with it then. Yeah. And I wonder... And it is an attack trigger. It's not a combat damage trigger, right? Yeah. So, it triggers regardless. Yeah. I, 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 I wonder how much you need them to have three artifacts. Like unblockable is nice, but I don't know how much time you spend like dedicated giving your opponent's artifacts or anything like that. No, I, I don't think you even need to, but no. I just think through the course of the game with treasures and other things like that, like people just them. tend to have them about yeah. half. Like, just saying she's unblockable half the time is pretty good. Pretty good. All right, let's talk about some synergies here. Um, the first category we have is cheap artifacts, yeah. because I think, you know, you're just thinking, like, what cool artifacts can I get out without altering Ayesha in any way? Right. And it turns out, like, a lot of the most powerful <laughs> artifacts are just, like, two CMC or less. Right. It's... <laughs> Pretty insane. Um, and I, I, w- I want to mention, I feel like this deck needs a really, really high density of artifacts. Oh, yeah. Like, if you can run, if it's an artifact, you run the artifact version of it. Um, so I think, like, artifact lands are particularly good because you're just getting rid of some of the types that are not artifacts. Yeah, you're but. not casting the spells, right? It's just put it's any just number put of artifacts it. on the graveyard. So artifact lands, like, um, what do we have down here? Ancient Den, Darksteel Citadel, Razor Tide Bridge. The, that's ramp, right? And yeah. it, you could find two or three of them. Yeah, no problem. That's nuts. Because if the first time you swing, I would rather get four lands almost than anything. Absolutely. That's a huge bump. And then, oh, they blocked her in combat and she died. Too bad I just put four artifacts into play. <laughs> right, exactly. I'll just play her again. So yeah. you're playing as many artifact lands as you can. Uh, speaking of mana, mana all, basically all mana rocks are two CMC now. Yeah. Um, so we're talking Cygnus, Talisman, Felwar Stones, Mind Stones, Thought Vessels. Do you even run like the diamonds in this? Probably. I think you do. I think you run, yeah, anything that's reasonable that's two CMC or less, you just run it, right? Because yeah. getting it out for free is so good. I, I think, you know, you, Winota misses sometimes because of lands and things like that. Right, yeah. But the, it's not going to be that uncommon, like Swing with Ayesha, all four cards, just put them out. It's so easy to include artifacts in your deck. There's artifacts that do sort of everything that you want. Um, so I, I think really focusing on keeping that high density and keeping your curve really, really low. Yeah. Um, is going to be super important in this deck. Because just low-carve artifact decks that don't have a cheat them into play are just good. Because, Already powerful, yeah. yeah. 
do you, do you think you play Amulet of Vigor in this deck so the stuff comes in untapped? I kind of love that. I, I think I think it's a good early drop play. It's a cheap artifact. It's easy to find. And it means when you attack with her, like if you can give her haste, you cast her with five mana, you give her haste, you attack, you hit two artifacts. Like you have two more mana to use. If you hit three artifacts, you have three more mana to use. I mean, if they're all mana producers. But right. yeah, yeah, you, good chance you're like basically giving getting a cost discount on her, being able to play another two drop. Yeah. yeah. Emula Vigor seems great because, again, she can cheat it out. Um, there's and a- I, I think this deck is full of things that like draw cards when artifacts enter. And so having those cheap ca- artifacts that may not feel super impactful are probably just going to be high synergy uh, moments anyway. Yeah, of course. Like if you create, if you take a bunch of artifacts and say, oh, but here's what it does. Okay, that's not great. Oh, but it costs zero mana, right? Yeah. You just get off the top of your deck and put it into play. Then all of a sudden, a lot of stuff becomes playable that wasn't before. Becomes really good. Yeah, yeah it's crazy. Uh, and there's just a bunch of cheap value artifacts that are playable now and just will be good in the same shell, which is like Esper Sentinel, Ethereum Sculptor. Reality Chip seems really, really good. Reality Chip and Mystic Forge are, I think, really cool tech in this deck because Sensei's Divining Top is also really good in this deck. So it's very easy to do like a cost reducer, like an Ethereum Sculptor with a Reality Chip and a Sensei's Divining Top and just blow through your entire deck. If you don't know Reality Chip, uh, when it's equipped, or sorry, when it's not equipped, you can look at the top card of your library, but when it's equipped, you can play the top card of your library. So this just kind of allows you to know, get a little bit of knowledge of what's on top of your deck, which might be important for Aisha. Uh, I mean, it will be important, but probably less important than you think if just everything's kind of a cheap artifact anyway. Right, yeah. um, Mystic Forge does a similar thing. Yeah. yeah. I think, you know, you can play your Lithoform engines and your Strionic Resonators to double up. Hey, look at four and then do that again. That, that Looking at great. eight is a lot. That's yeah. a lot of cards. <laughs> Usually, a lot of times, Strionic Resonator is the two mana isn't really worth it. But yep. if you're just getting like another eight mana worth of stuff out, it seems worth it. It seems I don't often <laughs> love a Strionic Resonator. It's really good in this deck. It's also a two CMC artifact. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> Cheat it out. Oh, sweet. Um, I, there's another build of this deck probably, or maybe there's a little crossover between the two, but yeah. I think you could build this deck sort of solely in the direction of like pumping Aisha's power. Because remember, as Aisha's power gets bigger, the size, the CMC of the artifacts she can cheat into play right. grows with her power. So she starts as a two, four, but if you could make her, uh, you know, a seven, nine, mm-hmm. um, then she would be able to put out seven mana value artifacts for free. Right. Not seven of them, se- you know, ones that cost yeah, seven like mana. Yeah, like your Meteor Golems, your Angel of Ruins, uh, Sandstone Oracle. There's some there's some really gross artifacts that you can cheat into play and some, you know, artifacts, equipment are artifacts, so you can find equipment to buffer power to get bigger and bigger artifacts into play. Yeah, that's the thing, is if you have a Sword of the Animist, uh, Black Blade Reforge is one I really like, because they're both 2 CMC, mm-hmm. and that will just be an equipment that she can cheat out that then can equip to her pumping her power, allowing you to get bigger things out later. Yeah. Um, Nettle Sis was one you put down, which is a living weapon, but it has equipped two and equip creature gets plus one, plus one for each artifact and or enchantment you control. Yeah. So that's pretty easy to put on her and just be like, oh, now she has 10 power and yeah. I can, I can cheat out basically anything I find on the top. Nettlesis put some really, really big things into play. And what's kind of neat with Nettlesis is it's an attack trigger. Yeah. So you can attack, hit artifacts off the top, and then she's bigger once it's time to do damage. Pretty brutal. <laughs> um, you had Iron Soul Enforcer as a card that I thought was really good. And Yeah. Yeah. So when it enters, or sorry, sorry, whenever Iron Soul Enforcer or a commander you control attacks alone, which not too hard to do. That's what you're trying to do anyway. Return target artifact card from your graveyard to the battlefield. So this is an artifact that you could hit if you had pumped Aisha's power a little bit mm-hmm. and then is going to start recurring your artifacts, which I think will be important in a deck like this. I put yeah. down Knowledge Pool as a mean card. That would be really good because yeah. once you're not casting the stuff, it doesn't mm-hmm. say cast it or uh, cast it without paying its mana cost. It says put the artifacts but- onto the battlefield. So you don't care about Knowledge Pool, which basically... Oh, I better read knowledge. Yeah, pool. read knowledge pool. Okay, it's a comboy card and kind of a mean card in general. And Especially to, in blue white, people are gonna be scared of this card. Yeah, but it is a good way to just say, okay, the game's gonna just kind of stall where it is. Yes. Um, really good in like Italian stuff too. No, because you cast the cards. Okay. Uh, it's a six man artifact. It has imprints. When it enters the battlefield, each player exiles the top three cards of his or her library. Then, whenever a player casts a spell from his or her hand, that player exiles the spell they cast. And if a uh, if when they do. 
he or she may cast another non-land card exiled with knowledge pool without paying the card's mana cost. So anytime you cast a spell, you don't get the spell you cast, you get one of the cards that's sort of exiled underneath knowledge pool. So it tends to just mean that people don't do much because they're not going to get what they play. They're going to get some random thing off the top of somebody's library or the last spell that somebody attempted to cast. Right. Yeah. It it basically means like it counters the first spell that they cast and then they cast a different one. Yeah. But the thing about you is you're like, cool, this is going to pause the game kind of where it is. Right. And But I'm still going to be swinging with Aisha. It makes Aisha a lot harder to remove because you kind of have to cast two remover removal spells to get to her. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And but you're like, I'm still doing my main plan, which is just put artifacts into play. Right. Yeah. So I thought that would be sort of a mean thing. Um, we talked about top deck manip- manipulation since he's divining top scroll rack is scroll another, another two mana artifacts that mm-hmm. scroll rack allows you to take cards from your hand, place them on top of your deck before you swing with Bayesha. So you can put all of the two CMC artifacts in your hand or a big one if you're cheating big artifacts into play uh, on top of your library and get it into play for free. Yeah, it's probably even better in the Voltron deck out. Honestly, because that deck's going to have more wide range of like what you could hit. Yeah. Um, because not everything will be two CMC or lower. So to be able to say, take that meteor golem and be like, okay, now I'm going to place it there and attack with the issue or in response to the trigger, place it there. Mm-hmm. So I know exactly the effect that I need and I'm getting. So I think, you know, top deck manipulation, blue and white are the best at that kind of what blue is obviously. Yeah. Um, Even a brainstorm is going to go a long way in a deck like this. Yeah. I, I, I sort of see this as probably like one of the, what we call artifactocrats decks where it's like scrap trawler, Clark Cran Ironworks. You try and get Ethereum Sculptor, Foundry Inspector out, those type of effects. So you're casting most of your artifacts for free. You do the whole rigmarole with like mere retrievers and stuff where you're just sacking the same artifacts and getting them back and sacking them. Mm-hmm. Saw me do this a little bit on the CLB episode um, of Game Nights. That tends to be the direction that these kind of like, hey, a lot of really small artifacts in the deck go, yeah. right? Like that's how they end up creating the value to win. Right. I I think blue-white artifacts, people are going to expect that this deck combos, uh, especially if you're doing a more value build and you're keeping your curve really, really low. Um, and Aisha's so good at finding them. Looking Just at the top four and through. putting it into play, you're seeing a lot of cards, uh, especially if you have a Strionic Resonator or anything like that. But um, I think it's going to be a natural combo build because you're seeing so many cards, because so many of them are artifacts, because artifacts combo so naturally. Yeah, some of the artifact combos that you put down are like Rings of Bright Hearth and Grim Monolith, which is infinite mana, mm-hmm. or Basalt Monolith will work. Um, Painter's Servant Grindstone. There are a bunch of artifact-based combos where it, the whole combo is just two artifacts. Yeah, uh, I'm sure there's some terrible Sword of the Meat combo. <laughs> white and Blue can both tutor can four it. artifacts, so you can find them. Mm-hmm. Enlightened Tutor will put that artifact on top of your library so that you know, uh, Aisha can just immediately find it. Oswald Fiddlebender is a card that probably goes in the deck. It's in there. It's kind of like Birthing Pod for Artifacts. Mm. Just a lot of ability to go and combo, go in the combo direction if you want to. And I found just, if you put Scrap Trawler, Park Crown Ironworks in your deck, you don't have to build a specific combo. They will just find it for you at yeah. some point in the game. You know, for- usually comboing with four or five other cards that you didn't even think about at the time that yeah. you were building it. So yeah, this deck's going to be very powerful. And we just know this archetype powerful. Yeah. And I, I think definitely it's something to keep in mind is Ayesha doesn't have to find both pieces. You right. can use your tutor to find the the second piece to whatever's on the battlefield already that Ayesha did find. Yeah, but she could find them. And if you have Amulet of Vigor, like put them onto the battlefield and go just go, go off right now. So something about, I guess that untaps it. So they won't be able to respond to artifacts hitting the battlefield. But, they have to respond to Aisha's trigger. Right. Because once it's on the battlefield, it's on the battlefield. So if you hit a combo piece and they're like, oh, I want to respond to Staff of Domination hitting the battlefield. You don't have priority yet. No. Yeah. You would have to do it before Aisha's triggers and you wouldn't know what you're getting yet. Right. Yeah. Thing is, it does put the things into play tapped. Right. And Amulet of Vigor untaps them, which is so, a trigger. Which is a trigger, yes. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, a little bit complicated, but still. Sweet. It, it, I mean, this, this might be one of those decks where, like Narset or something, where, like, you really can't let it swing one time. You certainly can't let it swing if they've got Skull Rack out. Yeah. Uh, yeah, it'll just depend. All right. Well, we started off with a banger. That one is powerful. It's, it's really crazy. <laughs> I think it's really fun. All right. The next one is 
not as powerful. I think it's, we can agree. It's, it's not. This is one of the uncommon commanders. This is General Marholt Ills Dragon. I remember the original Marholt Ills Dragon. <laughs> which is less good well, it's very similar but less good than this one I love that they took all these bad commanders that we just know and love and have been like I want to build Stang <laughs> and they made it playable it's right. really fun uh, so this is a elf a legendary elf warrior for two a red and a green he's a 4-4 four, four. it says whenever a creature you control becomes blocked it gets plus 3 plus 3 until end of turn for each creature blocking it right so this is a, a homage to an old ability called rampage so the original Rampage ability meant that every creature blocking this creature besides the first one gave plus X plus X to that creature where X was the number of Rampage. So if you had Rampage 1 and, you block, and then you got blocked by three creatures, you'd get plus 2 plus 2. If you had Rampage Weird. 2 and you got blocked by three creatures, you get plus 4 plus 4. This one doesn't say Rampage for that reason because it does count the first thing blocking the creature. Right. Yeah. So if you get blocked by one creature, you get the plus 3 plus 3. Which is way better, right? Like, right. Because stack blocks don't happen that often. They just really don't come up. Right. Um, which is why our first category, is, category we're calling Lure Tribal. Because yeah, Lure right. is an old card. Yeah, one of the OG, I think, alpha cards. Um, yeah, it's one green green for enchantment aura, enchant creature. All creatures able to block enchanted creature do so. Yeah. So it's forced blocking is what luring is. Uh, you know, you, you lure one creature, you put a lure on it, and all the other you know, defenders are like, I'm blocking that thing, yeah. which is useful in a couple of ways. One is it can allow you to sneak your other creatures in. Mm -hmm. You know, if you have five creatures, you put a lure on one, you attack with everything. Well, they have to block the one and the four are going to get through. Uh, the other thing is with things like Rampage and some other abilities, you can make that creature that's having to be blocked like bad news for your opponent. Really big. Yeah. yeah. And plus three plus three is going to be enough to kill a lot of creatures. That's blocking. It's going to make your creatures really hard to block. <laughs> I mean, Marhalt is a seven, seven when blocked. When blocked. So there's very few things that could block it profitably. And then every creature, if you stack blocked it, would have to be bigger than a three, three to make any difference. Right. right. So it would have to be a four, four, in which case you basically gain one power on it. Yeah. So it, 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 it's very hard to block any creature in the Marhalt deck. Um, there's a bunch of lure variants that mm -hmm. might be useful, and they, they're all similar, but not the exact same. Irresistible Prey uh, is a sorcery that does it, and you draw a card. So it doesn't, it's not like lure where it sticks around forever. Right. Um, there's an equipment called Nemesis Mask. This one's sweet. I actually haven't seen this one. Yeah, it's, uh, it's Equip 3. Uh, casting cost is three. All creatures able to block, or all, all creatures able to block equipped creature do so. That's cool because it's reusable. And often, maybe not in this deck, but in my experience, often you lure a creature and that creature is going to die because so many creatures are going to block it. Right. Yeah. So the ability to, like, okay, but then I put the mask on the next creature in line next right. turn or whatever. That's uh, also why Tempting Licit is so cool. Now, this is a crazy card because it turns into an aura. <laughs> tempting Licit is bizarre. It's a creature that you can turn into an aura. And then if the creature it's an enchanting dies, it, turns, it falls off and goes turns back into a creature. It's like sort of early bestow. I think it probably is the blueprint for bestow or yeah. this type of card. I think there was a few like this. Yeah. It, it What it is is a 2-2 two, two for three mana. You can pay a green and tap it. And it loses this ability and becomes a creature enchantment that reads all creatures able to block enchanted creature do so instead of a creature. And then... Uh, Move Tempting Listen onto the targeted creature, and you may pay green to end this effect. So at any time, you can have it hop off. Right. You have, yeah. so you have to hop it off. Yeah. So, it's, so it's, it is early bestow, but a little worse. Yeah. Uh, but that's really cool, because I think in the lure deck, it's the same problem with equipment decks sometimes, mm -hmm. where you may have your lure effect and not creatures, right? Because you have to draw the right amount of each ingredient. Mm -hmm. And this is a way to have a thing that this is a lure effect and a creature. So sometimes if I need the creature to put the lure on, this can play that role. Sometimes I have the creature, but I need the lure. This can play that both sides of that, um, which I think is really cool. Yeah. I wanted to make a note to be wary of cards that read a little similarly, but are not the same. Yeah. So there's uh, King Herald's Revenge. There's Compelling Duel or Compelled Duel. Both of these say um, they give a pump to the creature and then say it must be blocked this turn if able. Right. That is not the same as a lure because they only have to block it. They don't have to block it with everything. Right. So if they just have one creature block that, they have fulfilled their obligation and they can block your other creatures with their other stuff. Which is going to be a problem for this deck anyway. Your your creatures are going to be huge. They're going to want to block it. So I don't think these are going to make big differences in the deck. 
Well, that, okay, we're going to get to that. It's interesting because I don't yeah. think they're going to want to block you ever. I think their that's, their goal is going to be never block you, and you're going to have to force them to do it if that's what you want. Right. Um, because they're you'll be it'll be bad blocks every time, and it's less damage. Like Marhalt's not a seven seven hitting me; it's right. a four four hitting me. Right. It's a seven seven when I block it. Right. So naturally, it's better to just so let it hit true. me. Um, there's lure stapled to creatures too, so creatures that just come with the abilities, like Taunting Elf, is going to be really good in this deck. It's green for an O one. All creatures are able to block Taunting Elf do so. <laughs> that, this is the biggest Taunting Elf of all time. So it's a green for a zero one. It gets blocked by two creatures. Taunting Elf becomes a six seven. Think of how it's brutal perfect. this is if you just get this out as the first creature. Yeah. You can't play Regavan. You can't play Timna. You can't play Thrasios. Mm -hmm. You can't play a lot of... Because they just attack you. And you're like, I forced to block. And my two one gets eaten by your three four. Yeah. Because that's what it becomes. Now it's not gonna. It, you can't. You can't attack them if they don't have a creature because it just does zero damage. Yeah. But it's going to eat any creature they play unless they can give it haste and get it tapped right away or have a yeah. uh, vehicle or something else like that. Noble Query is speaking of bestow a bestow version of the same thing, which is really good because you use that as a lure on a creature. That creature dies. Now it jumps off, and it's a one one that says all creatures able to block Noble Query or enchanted creature when it's bestow. Do right. so. Um, so it's both a lure and a creature, again, like the Lissid. Yeah, very similar to the Lissid. The Lissid, unfortunately, doesn't lure when it is a 2-2, two -two, though. No. It has yeah, to be enchanted true. to lure, yeah. That's true. Um, yeah, then, you know, also, like, just creatures that want to be blocked will be good in this deck that, like, yeah. you're... You, because, again, if you're going to lure creatures, you can get additional effects from the creature that says when they're blocked, hey, Marhawk gives me plus three, plus three, but then they also have an ability that says when I'm blocked, I do something. Uh, assembled Alphas is a good one. I love that. Corrosive Ooze is a really cool one. It's when it becomes blocked by uh, equipped creatures. It destroys all equipped creatures. It, all or, the equipment. It, all the equipment, excuse me, uh, attached to that creature. So you can you can really uh, clean up in the right deck. Yeah. At least a, eat a, 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 a Lightning Graves or something. Yeah. Yeah. Because when they go, okay, I'm going to play my thing, put my Lightning Graves to protect it. Well, you better tap that thing or something because mm -hmm. I can just swing in with my Corrosive Ooze and eat the equipment on it. Yeah. Assembled Alpha is when it becomes blocked or or blocks. Uh, it deals three damage to that creature and three damage to that creature's controller. So again, if you lure on this thing and they have four or five creatures, it's going to do like 12 to 15 damage to them and for sure kill all those creatures because yeah. it's going to get huge and also do that three, three damage to the creatures. Uh, Naith of the Dire Hunt is sort of a payoff or a... Yeah, it's a payoff for, yeah. for lures, right? It's whenever one or more creatures you control fight or become blocked, draw a card. And she can also double the power of uh, your creatures. So I, I think Naith is an easy fit into a lure tribal deck like this, and it'll make sure that you keep finding more lure effects. Yeah, one of the problems with lures are that your opponents can get around it by just not having creatures that are able to block. So like we said, right. uh, tapping their creatures in some way, attacking with them. And generally what will happen is they will start doing that and the mirror go around will work in their favor because they have to attack to tap their creatures so they're not untapped so your lure doesn't get them. But that puts their shields down, which allows another player to attack them. And before you know it, everyone's kind of tapped. And so every time you're attacking, you're getting through, but it's not the it's not what you're trying to do because your creatures aren't getting pumped. They're not getting blocked. Mm. Um, and they still get to keep their creatures, which means their plan's still online. One of the great things about sort of luring into their creatures is you kill their creatures. It's right. removal in a way. So I think like being able to set up your lure could be important in the deck. There's stuff like Benefactor's Drought, which is one in a green for an instance. Untap all creatures until end, yeah, until end of turn. Whenever a creature an opponent controls blocks, draw a card, and you also draw a card when you cast Benefactor's Drought. So this is the thing where they they've gotten their stuff tapped, and you go, nope, untap all creatures, including yours. Now my lure thing's going to swing in, and you have to block because you have mm -hmm. blockers now. And now I'm going to draw all these cards and kill all your creatures. Um, Awakening is an enchantment that does a similar thing at the beginning of each player's upkeep, untap all creatures and all lands. So on right. your upkeep, everybody's creatures will untap. Now you untap all lands, which maybe is a downside. It is a little dangerous. I have run this card before and boy, did I lose to it. Yeah, it, it can help your opponents, but uh, Jangling Automaton is another interesting one. That sounds cool. Yeah, it's three mana for a 3-2. Um, when it attacks, untap all creatures defending player controls. So this one is you know, pretty good with a lure on it. Um, or a lure on one of your other creatures, all it has to do is attack. Yeah, and I think setting up that lure could be cool. Mm -hmm. um, 
Curse totem is neat because you're you're worried about creatures that getting like mana dorks just getting tapped and then not being able to block. So if you're turning off the activated abilities of little uh, value creatures that tap, then they are untapped for you to kill them on the blocks. Yeah. So curse totem is two mana for an artifact. Activated abilities of creatures can't be activated. Yeah, because like you said, mana dorks, tims, little things with activated tap abilities. Mm-hmm. Yeah, they can never block. Yeah. Right. Because you just tap them and then they're not available to block. But if you say, well, you don't ha- they don't have those abilities. Uh, Damping Matrix is another one that does activated abilities of artifacts and creatures can't be activated unless they're mana abilities. You're probably unlikely to have a bunch of artifacts that have activated abilities. Yeah. So, I mean, you're in Gruul, so I, you can really lean on land ramp. And so these things really don't get in your way. And this deck just wants to attack. Right? Yeah. And most of the stuff we've talked about is an enchantment or an instant or sorcery. Mm-hmm. There was that one equipment. Maybe just don't play that or... You just don't draw it on, you know, if you play Damping Matrix and you draw the card, well, I'm not playing that right now. Yeah. yeah. Uh, and then there's some cards that they're not straight up lure, but they're similar. They they definitely create a mess for your opponents. Invasion Plan says each creature blocks whenever able, which is good for your deck. Uh, it says attacking player chooses uh, how each creature blocks. So this is huge. You can really set up the blocks to make sure that it works out in your favor. Uh, that plus three, plus three goes enough to to get the job done. And Gren Melee does a similar thing. All creatures attack each combat of Fable, and all creatures block each combat of Fable. So if they're putting new creatures into play, they're blocking, regardless of what they are. I think it's going to be very difficult for your opponents to have any sort of value creatures on the board at all. Especially, like, even dorks, which you're kind of worried about, still have summoning sickness. So you can pick them off. That's true. As soon as you get combat. rolling, it's yeah. very hard to play a creature into your board. They, yeah. There would have to be a board wipe or something that they play. Because they have right. to be ahead of you in turn order right. to really play their creature. Yeah, that's a really good point. Anything you play that can't attack right now is going to be dead by the time it comes back to you. If you have any creatures at all, really. hmm uh, another thing that's really good with lures is death touch. Oh yeah. So there, there's an old combo which was lure and thicket basilisk, which basically killed all of anybody's cre- or all of your opponent's creatures back in the one v one old school days. But death touch, um, because they have to block with multiple things, is, and you're getting the you know even if you don't get enough power from the rampage effect, I'll call it that. Uh, the death touch will kill them, right? Like just mm-hmm. one, 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 one. You only have to assign one damage to be lethal. So giving your team death touch seems like a good idea. Or and yeah. Fr- frost fang will do that. Sarath the viper's fang will do that. I guess a lot of fangs involved. Bow of Nylea is a pretty cheap and nice mm-hmm. way to do it. It's attacking creatures you control. Death touch has other abilities. Yeah, that seems like another way to just make sure when you attack and they have to block their things dying. Yeah. Um, uh, another one I really like in this deck is No Quarter. Mm. Because you're an attack deck and you can really be stopped dead in your tracks if they have a single death toucher. If there's no Pheomancer on the board, right. you're in big trouble. Um, and No Quarter says if, if, uh, oh, there's I, a, I, ha- there, I should read this. I'm sure there's an oracle. There's an oracle text. Uh, Hold on, let me bring it up. One. Yeah, yeah. Let's, do, <laughs> let's do the oracle on No Quarter. But it makes sure that uh, little death touchers or little uh, powerful blockers are not as good as they seem. <laughs> uh, it says, whenever whenever a creature becomes blocked by a creature with lesser power, destroy the blocking creature. Whenever a creature blocks a creature with lesser power, destroy the attacking creature. So no quarter just says that if you're bigger, you win. Yeah, no damage is dealt between those creatures. That's why it'll kill, kind of kill the death touchers. Yeah. You should note that this ability checks on the block so Marhalt's ability will not be able to resolve before. So you won't get the plus three, plus three. But if your creature is just bigger than any creature blocking it at the time the block is declared, it, that creature is going to die before it, it sort of claps back on them. Um, interesting wording. Should work against, like you said, the death yeah. touchers, which are mostly small. Yeah. Yeah. Um, the other thing that no quarter is great with is trample. Yeah. Because the creature is destroyed. So if you have a lure effect and you attack with a trample creature, they have to block. All the little creatures are destroyed. You get the rampage triggers and all of that damage comes through because there's no creatures left to block the damage. So I think trample is actually really powerful in this deck, especially if you combine it with uh, the death touch that we were talking about. Yeah, I'm calling it trampage. 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 So yeah, there's and and green and red at sell at this. So it's not hard to find cards that will give all your stuff trample, but Garrick's Uprising will do it. Archetype of Aggression is a really good one. Mm -hmm. Yeah. 
just getting them to, if you lure and attack, you're going to have a lot more power just from that than they have toughness most of the time. Because people just don't have, you know, five, four, fours out generally. It's a lot of little stuff and maybe one big thing. And so just being able to send that extra damage through to them in addition to killing all their creatures, I think is just good even without Death Touch. For sure. A lot better with Death Touch. We mention this every time and every time we get some messages they're like, I had no idea it worked this way. If you have Trample and Death Touch, then you only have to assign one damage to the creature and the rest will always go over. So right. if your 7-7 seven, seven is blocked by their, you know, 6-6, six, six, if you have Death Touch, you're going to do six damage to them and kill that creature. Sorry, six. Yes. Yeah. yeah so one damage good. to the creature. The creature dies. The rest. The rest goes over. Yeah. Because you're only required as the attacker. You're only required to assign lethal damage to each creature. The rest can go everywhere else. Yeah. With death touch, one damage is lethal. Is lethal. You found a cool card here that's pretty fun. Uh, it's called Hortswood Crasher. You want to read it? This card is so fun in this deck. So this is a five five uh, five mana six six with trample that says whenever one or more creatures you control with trample deal combat damage to a player, create an XX green dinosaur beast creature token with trample where X is the amount of damage those creature dealt to that player. So this card is great all on its own, even if you don't have other trample enablers and you're not doing trample tribal because it triggers itself. Right. Um, so they block with two two. You are getting a four four token out of this right and it's also very annoying to block with your commander because it's now it's a nine nine trample right this is getting through but if they don't block it then you get a nine nine with right. two, or you, you get but a they six do, six with yeah trample. you get a six six with trample so what i really like in this deck is cards that trigger on on combat damage because they're like well i need to block it what if i but block, if I block it, it, it it's worse dies. yeah so i kind of like, if you're not going in the direction of all the lure effects and wiping their board every time, I like having these big, powerful creatures that are like, you're going to need to block this. And if you don't, you're going to be punished for not blocking this. Yeah, it's it's a no-win situation, right? You put yes. them in. Yeah. yeah. If you block it, it's bad for you. If you don't block it, it's bad for you. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, and then, of course, the next category I'm going to call ability stacking, which is there's a bunch of stuff that's good with what you're already doing. So you're probably going to want haste, right? Like Horsewood Always. Crasher, you do not want to play it and just be like, go. <laughs> you want to play it and attack with it. So Rhythm of War, it, or sorry, Rhythm of the Wild is a really good way. Mm -hmm. It makes your stuff uncounterable. And it also allows you to give it haste or make it bigger. If you want to make it bigger, you almost always want to give it haste. Yeah. Um, anger is just a great red card. You're probably playing the Faithless Losing, the Thrill of Possibilities, all red decks play, Wheel of Fortunes type stuff. And anger in your graveyard gives all your stuff haste. Also, what's really good with Death Touch is First Strike. First Strike and Double Strike. Yeah, because, again, if you have Death Touch and you have First Strike, you deal the damage during the First Strike part of the damage phase, and then they're dead. They don't get to clap back on you at all. Yep. Um, so you don't exchange any damage there. Ember Cleave is in these colors. Team or Battle Rage would probably be insane. Kill people out of nowhere with cards like that. Yeah. Yeah, I, I wanted to say, because as we were sort of, you know, going down the list here, and listing off all the cool things you can do this card. And I think we both kind of like, cool. yeah, exactly. I it's looked at the card cool. and I was like, eh, and then started putting it out. I was like, it's pretty cool. It's pretty cool. There's a lot of different things. You can put no quarter in a deck. It's pretty cool. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. But I, I started to get worried that there's so many different directions and it's going to be really easy for this deck to be kind of bad because you tried to do all the stuff we just said. Right. Like you can't give Death Touch, Trample, First Strike. You won't have any creatures. You'll just be giving abilities yeah. to creatures. So you kind of have to pick your lane. And I think sort of going back and like taking a step back and kind of thinking about, you know, what your plans, you know, what you're focusing it on, mm -hmm. you know, to focus your plan. Uh, I had Truck go back and look at the same games he did at the same time. So it's fine. It wasn't double work. Um, and the same amount of games from XT and, uh, and GK. And he said that on average, again, small sample size just gives us an idea. Mm -hmm. On average, players had about 2.8 creatures in play on turn five. Sure. So your dreams of like killing seven creatures with your lure are not that likely, mm -hmm. right? You're probably killing three, four creatures at most from only one player, remember, because you've got to get a creature down, get Mar hauled out, get a lure on it, get an attack in. They have to be untapped. There's a lot of ifs there. Right. You're already spending. So if you spend a creature and a card, you're spending two cards to get maybe three, maybe three creatures. I think the most likely outcome is that you're playing a deck where your creatures, your opponents just do not want to block like you were talking about. Yeah. And so I think focusing your deck towards like, okay, well, if I'm playing a deck where my creatures are just naturally hard to block, my opponents don't want to do it, what takes advantage of that? And then I think like 
one of your favorites or one of the things you're known for. Toski, <laughs> bearer of secrets that draws you cards when you deal combat damage to players. Nature's will is uh, whenever one or more creatures uh, you control deal combat damage to a player, untap all lands uh, you control and tap all lands they control. Grenzo Havoc Razor kind of goads creatures or impulsively draws you. Professional Face Breaker, one of my favorite cards from like the last so year. Cool. Makes you treasures. Popular Entertainer is a background I think could be really good. Whenever one or more creatures you control deal combat damage to a player, go target creature that player controls. So now you're just putting them in these no-win situations of like, listen, I'm attacking. You know, it's if it hits you, I'm goading your stuff. Yeah. If you block it, your thing dies because my thing be- gets a giant growth for free. Yeah. And so, you know, maybe you have a lure or two in there, but I think lure.deck is probably not the best way to go. Yeah, I think I think a lure or two or some creatures that naturally lure is going to be the best way to do it. But I definitely love it as a gruel strategy that's like, I don't need evasion. They're going to be too big. And yeah. it's it's very gruel and it's very, it's very cool. Very gruel and very, very cool. cool. <laughs> All right. Uh, on to the next one here. I, this is another, th- well, I mean, they're all throwbacks, but this is one that I think is more present or more prominent. Yes. Hazazon, Shaper of Sand. This this is a deck we see from time to time. You don't see a lot of original Marhal Elves dragons running around. <laughs> right, right. <laughs> they're a little too bad to see play. But this new Hazazon is really sweet. It's one of the commanders that uh, I am super psyched about. It is a Naya Lands Matter deck, but more specifically, Desert Smatter. Desert Smatter. <laughs> All right, it is Naya, red, green, and white for 3-3 three, three, Human Warrior, has Desert Walk, which means it can't be blocked as long as Defending Player controls a desert. Not likely to come up that often. You may play Desert Lands from your graveyard, so it is a Crucible of Deserts. <laughs> and whenever a desert enters the battlefield under your control, create two 1-1 one, one, red and green, oh, sorry, red, green, and white Sand Warrior Creature Tokens. We know original Jose Zan likes lands, likes making tokens, this is similar, but just desert focused. I love. Yeah, I wanted. They're sand warriors. They're sand warriors. <laughs> I wanted to do a little breakdown about the deserts, yes. specifically in red, white, and green. So I'm calling this desert data. There are 16 total deserts in these colors. Three of those deserts have cycling. Important because you can get them into the graveyard and then play them with the Zazam. Very cool. Three of the deserts have a uh, sacrifice ability. Can either sacrifice themselves um, oh, sorry, can sacrifice themselves. Yeah. Four of the deserts can sacrifice a desert. Right. So right. any desert you control, including the cycling ones. Which is great, right? Because you sack a desert, then you play it as your land for turn out of your graveyard with the Zazon out. Yeah. Get the ability uh, of making the tokens. And then three of the deserts enter the battlefield tapped. This is for the Amulet of Vigor question, which I think answers, no, you don't have to play it. If only three of the 16 deserts have uh, come and play tapped. Yeah, it's just the just the cycling ones, I think, come in. Yeah. Maybe you still play Amulet Vigor, but it was just a thing that I was yeah. sort of considering. Uh, uh, something I did notice with the deserts is uh, only six of them tap for colored mana. Oh, that's true. And you're in a three-color deck, so that could be a yeah. little bit of an issue. Well, there's one that requires you to tap a creature to do it, but many, many of the deserts are colorless. Um, so your fixing does need to be strong in this deck in order to run all of, all of the de- deserts. Because your commander is red, green, white. Like That's you, true. you have to hit the color pips. Yeah, you're probably not playing it. Yeah, well, you're probably not playing one of the colorless deserts as one of your first three, three lands, right? right? Yeah, 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 for so sure. So that's that's a that's actually a consideration because if so many of them are colorless, the rest of your deck has to be like triomes and you know the Naya land, the Naya tri land, mm-hmm. you know shocks and probably the thing I thought about this whole data thing was that 16 is a very low number of deserts. We generally on the show have kind of identified somewhere around 25 of a thing really means that like you have a strong enough amount of it for that to be your theme. Right. Yeah. And 16 is well below 25. Mm -hmm. So the first category here is what I'm calling desert multipliers because we need access to more desert enter the battlefields than the 16 lands is going to give us. Um, There are desert tutors. You put down Realms Uncharted. Realms Uncharted is great because if they choose whatever they choose to send to the graveyard, you can still get back with a Zizan. Yeah. So this is an instant. You search your library for four lands with different names, reveal them, and then an opponent chooses two of those cards and you put the chosen cards in the graveyard and the rest into your hand. So yeah, you just choose four deserts. You're getting two in the graveyard and, and you're going to play those out of the graveyard. So you got four deserts out you, of it. Yes. Basically. Elvish Reclaimer is another way. 
to sort of find specific lands. There's there's a bunch of land tutors that will do this. Yeah. Um, I mean, I, in this deck, I love the land tutors that actually sacrifice lands also. So crop yeah. rotation is really good. But Elvish Reclaimer is really strong as well because it sacrifices a desert to put it in the graveyard. You can replay the desert from your graveyard and, and trigger it. found you another again. desert to yes. play. Yeah. Yeah. Because you want to get this merry around where you've got deserts in play, deserts in the graveyard, deserts in your hand, and you're kind of moving them from zone to zone right. and getting as many triggers as you can. Another way to move them from zone to zone is bounce lands. So I think you're probably playing, you know, most of the bounce lands you can play because you play desert, you get the trigger off for Zazon, you play a bounce line, you bounce it back to your hand, you play the desert again. That kind of makes the bounce line similar to a desert, right? right? Yeah. And then it gives you another desert into your hand. It's kind of, a bounce line almost reads like, draw a card that will be a desert, right? Right. Especially if only three of the deserts enter the battlefield tapped, bounce lands aren't, aren't a huge cost. Yep. Maybe you do play Amulet Vigor now if you're playing bounce If lands you're playing all the bounce lands, that's yeah. true. Uh, just being able to sacrifice your lands, sack your lands, I said, uh, is really good because, again, his, yep. you have a Crucible of Worlds in your command zone. So Sylvan Safe Keeper allows you to sack mm-hmm. uh, lands to give a creature a uh, shroud until I'm turn, which is great because you can protect your Hazazon or whatever. Uh, Zurin Orb lets you sack sacrifice lands for uh, life, but it's also a zero cost artifact. So it's very cheap effect to put into play. Like I mentioned, crop rotation and all of these abilities that we have that we've seen in other decks that let you sacrifice your lands and to ramp. So Harrow and all of the iterations of Harrow. I think there's three now. Yep. Spr- Spring Gloom uh, Druid. Spring Gloom Druid. Uh, there's another instant that does it. Escape Shift is extremely powerful God, in this deck. Is so good. <laughs> it's insane. So even if you're like, you know what? I don't want to sack all my lands i'm just going to sack f- these three deserts i have and get three more deserts so that i can play the deserts with his on my graveyard i'm going to make 12 sand warrior tokens yeah escape shift is a uh, four mana for a sorcery sacrifice any number of lands search your library for up to that many land cards put them onto the battlefield tap then shuffle your library so yeah you can sack all your lands if you want if you had seven sack seven find seven deserts you know but you don't have to you can just sack the as many as you want. This is a cool card you found. I so I have been looking for a deck <laughs> to put this card in since it was printed, and I think this is finally the one. <laughs> it's Nahiri's Litho forming. Uh, it's a red X spell that says sacrifice X lands. Already good. Uh, for each land sacrifice this way, draw a card. You may play X additional lands this turn. Lands you control enter the battlefield tapped this turn. So. I like this. I like Nahiri's Lithophore where X is like three, yeah. right? Because you sacrifice three deserts, you draw three cards, and you have three extra land drops to play all of those deserts from your graveyard. I don't think, I think a lot of the time we look at the spell and we're like, I want X to be 10. And it's like, I think it's great at like four. <laughs> I mean, I think it, however many deserts you have, you can just yeah. sack that many kind of for free. Yeah. Right. I mean, you did use the mana and everything, but you're going to replay them with a Zazon. And you have all the additional land drops to do yeah. so. So it just says sort of draw X cards, make X times two one ones. Yeah. Right. For red, red and X, which is pretty good. Seems, price. seems pretty strong here. So this is another one where Amulet of Vigor is actually I, quite dead. I think we've decided now that <laughs> Amulet of Vigor needs to be in this deck. <laughs> it was a question with just the deserts, but now all the support cards seem to mm. want it. So, yeah. If you have Amulet out, and here's Lithoforming is insane because now you pay only two mana, sack all your lands, right? So let's say you have nine lands out, sack, I guess, seven. Yeah. Replay, hopefully you have seven deserts. But even you're going to draw seven cards. So if you have four deserts, you probably still sack the seven, just assuming, hey, I'm going to have another three lands in my hand. Because remember, mm. as I'm playing them out of the graveyard, it makes the, the sacking not a big deal. Right. Yeah. Uh, Spl- Splendid Reclamation, Titania, these are all like, classic lands matter cards when you're especially when you're on the sacrifice my land side of the lands mm-hmm. matter there's sort of there's the discard lands as a lands matter deck there's yep. the landfall more and then there's the graveyard synergy lands matter deck and this is sort of they all overlap but this is sort of more i think on the graveyard synergy uh yeah. Sack my lands side of things. The cool thing about this deck is this is the first time the graveyard strategy lands matter deck has had white. Yeah. So you get to add cool things like cosmic intervention, uh, fate's reward. Ooh. These have not typically been like in a Gitrog deck. Because they're can't usually really in Jund them. or something. They're yeah. Jund. Or Gruul. Uh, so it's your first time getting all of these return, all of them to the battlefield effects. Um, and it's really, really powerful. Uh, <laughs> there is a card that I'm really psyched about in this deck. It's um, it might draw a little bit of hate, but it's Realm Razor for three and Naya. It's a four two beast. It says when it comes into play, remove all lands from the game. 
sick. People will love it. Uh, when Realm Ra- Razor leaves play, return the removed cards to play tapped under their owner's control. So this is if you're of, ahead, if you're ahead, you can you can put this into play. And you put like it removes everybody's lands from play, including your own. This is like a knowledge pool play. It is a bit of a knowledge pool play, but it's as easy as getting rid of a beast token for everybody or a four two beast for everybody to get their lands right. back. And but when uh, your lands come be, back. Oh, uh, yeah. When your lands come back, all of your deserts trigger your commander and you make, you know, six, eight more, more sand warrior tokens. Yeah. So it might even be um, sort of right, quote unquote, in certain times of play realm raiser. And then, like, end set before your turn, sack it. Mm-hmm. All lands come back into play. Make 21 ones. Now yeah. I have 21 ones on my turn. Yeah. I wanted to go back to Cosmic oh, Intervention yeah. and Fates Reward yeah. just so people understand what those cards oh, do. Oh, sorry. No, that's okay. Um, both of those cards basically say you return to the battlefield all permanent cards in your graveyard that were put there from the battlefield this turn. Yeah. So that becomes a, like, scape shift of Nahiri's Lithoforming, a Zirin Orb, a Sylvan Safekeeping, where you can just use those to just get a bunch of his on t- triggers mm-hmm. at instant speed. Like cosmic intervention is a foretell foretell card. Tell. <laughs> yeah. So if you have that foretold out there and you're like, okay, cool. On the inside before my turn, sack all my deserts flip over or sorry, I think you flip over cosmic intervention first and then sack all your deserts. Yes. Uh, <laughs> Important. They would thing. go to the graveyard. Instead, they go back into play and you make a million, uh, one, one warrior tokens. And yeah, that, Realm Razor kind of does a similar thing in a different uh, order, but yeah. yeah. Just mass landfall effects in this deck. Yeah, and then, of course, we're going to play all the lands matter cards that most of these decks play. We won't go over these a lot, but, you know, you want to play extra land drops, so Exploration, Azusa, Wayward Swordtooth, etc. Uh, you probably want some landfall triggers in there, so everybody's favorite, Scoot Swarm, you know, probably... Um, Maya or Maja, Bredegard, Protector. Mm-hmm. Uh, you probably want some token synergies, so you've got access to all the best ones. Felidar Retreat is yep. one of my favorite cards. It's going to be incredible in this deck, right? Because you make you make a couple of tokens, maybe, but I think Felidar Retreat is often just loading up your Sand Warriors with tokens. Yeah, so it does both, right? Whenever you yep. play a land, it's landfall, make a 2-2, or put a 1-1 counter on all of your creatures. So, yeah, you're right. It's probably like first couple, but once you have more than two creatures, it's better to put one on counters because you're getting more you're power. Getting more power, yeah. Yeah. Uh, Parallel Lives, Annoying Procession, just make more tokens. So Desert, uh, Landfall, make four things. Mm-hmm. Seems pretty good. And then, of course, you're going to want, you know, some way to win the game, which is going to be some kind of Crater Hoof variant, Triumph of the Hordes, Beastmaster mm-hmm. Ascension. One of those. Um, then I had, oh, oh, sorry, I'm skipping two other things here that you put down that I think is uh, relevant. Or one other thing, which is, it is a warrior tribal deck possibly it's you have a lot of warriors in play um and so i i think i think having a tribal card in there is actually quite strong specifically lovisa cold eyes means that every time a desert enters the battlefield so she says uh each creature that's a barbarian or a warrior or a berserker gets plus two plus two and has haste oh, yeah. so instead of making one one soldier tokens you're making three three soldier tokens warrior tokens, or warrior right. tokens yep, excuse yep. me <laughs> oh, you're making three three warrior tokens with haste with haste so, so when you do this thing where shift. you scave shift, you're like, no, I just made 23 threes with haste. Yeah, that's it. It, it turns from kind of scary to game winning to game winning. Yeah. yeah. And I think to kill you, <laughs> I think it's very interesting uh, because it, people see Lovisa Cold Eyes and they're like, mm, that's cute. But they're not afraid as afraid of it as some of the other overruns that we're used to. And it's going to be just as lethal if you have one of these big uh, landfall ETB spells. Yeah, the haste is big. Huge. Again, you can still play Anger and things like that in mm. the deck like this. Uh, Bramblewood Paragon, another warrior tribal card that says each other warrior creature you control comes into play with an additional 1-1 counter on it, and each creature you control with a 1-1 counter on it has Trample. Yeah. That is just, and it's a two drop, so you can just... So cheap. This come in, comes into play under your commander, and you can start making two twos right away. Okay, so I'm going to wrap this up with the mean section. Yeah. If you want to be mean, I think there is a way to do that, and that is destroy all the lands in the game. Uh, because you have a crucible of worlds in your command zone, so if Azazon's out and the coast is clear, if you Armageddon, Catastrophe, Ravages of War, these are all mm. cards that are sorceries that say destroy all lands on them, uh, you're going to be able to play your lands out of your graveyard, and your opponents probably will not. And that is a 
way to ice the game. Especially if you have one of these big brought back spells that we were talking about before. Oh, yeah. If you have Cosmic Intervention and you go Armageddon, or sorry, flip over Cosmic Intervention, cast Armageddon, you're going to win that game. Yeah. People tend to not like those cards, though, so just fair warning, they will probably be mad about it. And it's worth mentioning before you play the deck that you do have mass land destruction. In yeah, the deck. You, should, you all should know. <laughs> Give it a I little, might blow up all the lands. Give it a little heads up. <laughs> that tends to make them less mad when it happens, honestly. So yeah, I mean, it it's also, worth it. I think because mass land destruction is part of the social con- contract that it doesn't happen. Saying that you do does it, you you have it in your deck allows your opponents to like keep lands in their hand and yeah. prepare for that to happen to them, and it it does make it a. And little so bit when easier. it happens, even if they didn't do those things, they at least play like, yeah, I knew that could happen, and it's a little bit their responsibility, right? right. Yeah. You Whereas it's like, wait a minute, I didn't know we were on that kind of game. Yes. Yeah. yeah. It's huge. All right, let's talk about the next commander here. I remember yeah. the original Jasmine Boreal. I'm so excited that we have that we have a Jasmine that, that's playable. It's Jasmine Boreal of the Seven. It is a legendary human druid for one, a green, and a white. She's a 2-4, and it has an activated ability that says add green, white. Spend this ability only to cast creature spells with no abilities. Creatures you control with no abilities can't be blocked by creatures with abilities. Uh, it's worth noting that the original Jasmine Boreal did not have any abilities. Does nothing. Yeah, it does literal <laughs> nothing. Has cool art, though. Does have cool art. <laughs> Beloved card, Jasmine Boreal. Um, okay, so this is Celestia Vanilla Creature Tribal. Mm-hmm. And we have seen a Vanilla Creature ty- Tribal deck recently. So I think the first card everybody kind of thought of when they saw this is Ruxa Patient Professor. And yeah. Ruxa, I'm going to read because it's definitely going in this deck. For sure. But this is also the most direct comparison we have. And if you were starting this deck, I think you would go on EDH Trek and at least look at what's in the Ruxa, Ruxa deck. Kind of, It doesn't have white, but to kind of give you a jumping off point. So Ruxa is two green green for a 4-4 four, four bear druid. Whenever Ruxa enters the battlefield or attacks, return target creature card with no abilities from your graveyard to your hand. And then creatures you control with no abilities get plus one, plus one. And also, you may have creatures you control with no abilities assign their combat damage as though they weren't blocked. So Jasmine is a little lower to the ground, three CMC instead of four, has white instead mm-hmm. of just green, and basically ramps you, gives you right. mana that you can only use on no ability creatures, and then just says your creatures with no abilities can't be blocked by creatures with abilities, which basically means your creatures can't be blocked because I can't think of any card, creature card, that I guess tokens. Tokens. Tokens are the anything. only thing, yeah. yeah. Tokens usually have no uh, abilities. Yes. But besides tokens, your creatures can't be blocked. Uh, basically could say your creatures can't be blocked by non-token creatures Mm -hmm. just because nobody really plays creatures in Commander that don't have abilities. And I guess a Ruxa versus Jasmine deck would be interesting. (laughs) Anyway, so... It wouldn't do anything? (laughs) (laughs) They just... No, a Ruxa deck probably is in good shape there because can get blocked but still deals the damage, yeah. Mm -hmm. So looking at the Ruxa deck just for some inspiration and just seeing what it does already well, you're probably taking, you know... Quite a few pieces from it. There's like Murgon and Petroglyphs, which is four mana for an enchantment. Creatures with no ability get plus two, plus two. Uh, Sylvan Anthem. Yeah. Green, green for enchantment. Green creatures get plus one, plus one. And whenever a green creature enters the battlefield, you control scry one. Gravity Wells are a really good one. Mm -hmm. One green, green for enchantment. Whenever a creature with flying attacks, it loses flying until end of turn. So if you think about Jasmine and Ruxa, you don't want to give your creatures abilities. So if that, if Gravity Wells said, your creatures have flying or have reach, it suddenly gives them an ability and all the other techs on their commanders don't work. But Gravity Well takes away flying from your opponent's creatures. So it kind of gives all your creatures reach without actually giving them an ability. Right. That's that's why I like Sylvan Anthem as well, is it it gives your creatures a thing that they do without altering the text on the card. Yeah. Uh, then you get to play the Elemental Bonds and the Guardian Projects for some card draw. You're really going to need them. Yeah. So... I think Ruxa gives you, oh, Ruxa, of course, also gives you like Toski, who mm-hmm. keeps coming up, but that's card draw. Again, doesn't give the creatures the ability. Um, so you may play a couple creatures that have abilities just to kind of, for, so your deck can function. You need card draw, right? You're yeah. still going to need ramp and things like that. And of course, green gives you a lot of efficient creatures. Because in general, the only way a vanilla creature is going to be in any way playable in Commander is if it's cost to power toughness ratio. Right. is very much in your favor. So like Colonial Tusker is a 3-3 three, three for green green or uh, Terrain Elemental, 3-2 for 2 mana. Yep. Rampaging Baylos is a 6 mana card that has an ability, but it creates 4-4s four that don't have abilities. Yes. Yeah. 
And I think, I think honestly, that's probably the way that I would go if I was building this deck. Um, is more tokens? Is is more is more tokeny, but especially those like thick tokens that come down and they're like they're four fours and they are unblockable. That's a scary, a scary effect. Yeah. So uh, the the question here is sort of what white adds to the mix. And speaking of tokens, we know white's good at tokens, so yes, it's already going to help us there. Um, I'm calling the next section white is vanilla. Um, because, you know, vanilla is usually white. I'm funny. Okay. <laughs> Anthems and enchantments. Marari's Wake. Gotta is have it. it. Yeah. Ramps you and pumps your creatures. Or a shard seems really good. Because you're not going to be able to play Reclamation Sage. But if you, all your creatures just destroy an artifact or enchantment when they enter the battlefield, that uh, seems pretty good. White gives you all the protection and the defense, right? Huge. Yeah. yeah. To fairy's protection. You get access to that. Uh, cosmic Intervention we keep mentioning. Which, by the way, if you're not playing that card, I think you're probably doing it wrong. So it's very good. It will save you in so many situations. And what are you going to do against a board wipe? It's not like you've already got value off their your creatures. Right. Yeah. So. It's also better than giving them indestructible, especially in this deck, but just generally because you can get around toxic J- deluge and um, other effects that don't necessarily destroy your creatures. Yep. Uh, but do kill them. Um, Drum Bellower is one you put down, which I really like. I love this yeah. card. So. I, th- I think the problem with this deck is it's good. you're going to want to be really, really aggressive. You have Your to be, right? Your creatures are yeah. unblockable. You're attacking. You're using anthems. You're doing damage. So you're going to attract a lot of attention. So I like cards in this deck that untap your creatures and give you a little bit of defense as well. And I think Drum Bellower is really a good way to do that. Uh, Reconnaissance, I yep. think, is really amazing in this deck because it essentially gives your creatures vigilance also, without giving them vigilance. <laughs> Yeah, so we, we always have to talk about Reconnaissance yes. and kind of break it down because people always don't understand it. Reconnaissance is one white for an enchantment. It has an activated ability, which costs zero, and you remove target attacking creature you control from combat and untap it. And it says in parentheses, that creature neither deals nor receives damage this turn. So easy to misunderstand this card, but the way that steps and phases of combat work is that there is a damage phase of combat, and then... There is a post damage phase of combat where you're still in combat, but damage has already happened. Mm-hmm. And during that part, you can activate reconnaissance's ability, untap your creature, remove it from combat, but the damage has already been dealt. So reconnaissance will not take away damage that already happened. It just takes away any further damage that would happen because it's not a combat anymore, but because mm-hmm. there's combat's over. So trust us, you can use reconnaissance to untap your creature after it's dealt its damage. Also means if they have like one big blocker and you've got four creatures, you can just freely swing in whatever one they block. Your reconnaissance is out of combat, deal damage with the other three, untap them after damage. And now you just basically gave pseudo vigilance to, their, to all, your whole team and allowed an attack that maybe would have been disadvantageous for you. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I love this card. So, yeah, going to be really good in the stack. I think you're right, too. You're going to be out swinging early and your advantage is early because most of your creatures are low to the ground and efficient. Right. They're going to get worse as the game goes on because once they start playing, you know, Consecrated Sphinx and things, like those things are have other abilities which are making them cost more, but they can block your Colonian Tuskers and things like that, maybe. So, unless you have your commander in play. Yeah. Oh, yeah. That's a good point. They can't <laughs> block at all. But they're going to start like getting their feet under them and being yes. able to do things like wipe the board and whatnot. So you can't For sit around and wait. Um, you got to. Halo Fountain on here. Yeah, this is another great defensive card, uh, but it also has the upside of making creature tokens uh, without abilities. So Halo Fountain is a new card. It is an artifact for two and a white. It has three activated abilities. White, tap, untap, a tapped creature you control, create a 1-1 green and white citizen creature token. So you untap the Halo Fountain, or sorry, you tap the Halo Fountain, but you untap a creature as part of the cost. Yes, and you make a body with no abilities. It also says white, white, tap, untap, two tapped creatures you control, draw a card. And it says white, 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 five whites, tap, <laughs> <laughs> untap 15 tapped creatures you control, you win the game. So if you ever have 15 creatures and you can attack with them, Halo Fountain will win you the game. I've never seen that happen. I haven't seen it happen either, but uh, it's pretty sweet. Um, but I think it's largely going to be the first and second abilities yeah. that are going to be really good in this deck. It's a card draw engine. It's a creature engine, uh, I think. And it gives you a little bit of defense. So I think Halo Fountain is quite good. Um, and then, of course, more token makers, which you alluded to, Felder Retreats, we already talked about. I think Blessed Sanctuary is probably great pretty one. good in this yeah. deck. It's three white, white for an enchantment. Prevent all non-combat damage that would be dealt to you and creatures you control. And then whenever a non-token creature enters the battlefield under your control, create a 2-2 two, two white unicorn creature token. So as you're playing, your sort of efficient creatures. It's going to make more tokens, but also kind of prevents burn a little bit. Um, 
Worth noting on the Felidar retreat, if you put plus one counters on everything, they do gain vigilance. So you do have to be careful with that. Yeah, I, I think you're just making tokens. Yeah. Unless, you know, you could get to the point where you're like, you know, depending on what else is happening. I need it to be bigger. Yeah, just fetch land, do it, put two on everything, attack. Like, it might yeah. be worth it. Yeah. Um, Reese the Redeemed is another Huge. one. We, you know, there's a, anointed processions and the Cathar's Crusade and mm-hmm. all that. So, yeah. And then White also just sort of has low to the ground efficient creatures like Isamaro, Savannah Lions. Those are one mana, mm-hmm. two power uh, creatures. You get some adventure cards, which I think are interesting. Because that's a way to kind of have your creature have an ability, but it's still vanilla creature. So like Shepherd of that. the Flock. Yeah. Yeah, has like a bounce spell stable to it. So it gives you some utility because that's my big worry with playing these vanilla right. creature decks is like, I just, there's not a lot of different things I can do. Right. I can do the one thing really well, but what do I do when this strategy is yeah. part of me? Card yeah, card efficiency is so important in Commander. So you really want your cards to do stuff. And I think that's why tokens is really going to be the way to go. But having these adventure uh, cards is so, is so cool because it does give you two spells. Um, yeah, it just gives you the ab- ability to maybe deal with some outside the box stuff that like, yeah. you know, your regular Colonial Tusker is not going to be able to do anything about. Can Shepherd of the Flock be targeted by Ruxa in the graveyard? Because Ruxa ETBs gets a creature with no abilities from the graveyard back? I believe so, because it is it the is creature a, part of it still has no abilities. Yeah. yeah. Cool. Yeah, I think so. so. You put oh, it boy. back in your hand, recast your adventure spell, cast yeah. your vanilla creature. That's pretty sweet. Oh, boy. I'm not a judge, so I hope that was right. Yeah, we'll probably have cut this out of the episode if it wasn't. So I'm assuming that if you're hearing it, it was right. All right. Uh, we're about halfway through here. Next up, we have another old school commander. And I think one of the more powerful ones we're going to talk about today But before we get into that, we've got to take a quick break and hear a message from our sponsors. We'll be right back. Whoa, whoa, don't get too close. Sorry, I'm Sten, paranoid partisan. It's not you. I just can never let my guard down. You see, hunting for Rexian sleeper agents is a dangerous game, but I can't do it alone. That's why I use Indeed, the platform where you can attract, interview, and hire all in one place. I need employees I'm sure I can trust, but I can't abandon the hunt to spend ages trawling through resumes. But with Indeed, finding qualified investigators was fast and easy, thanks to tools like assessments, virtual interviews, and my favorite, Instant Match, which gives me a short list of qualified candidates the moment I sponsor a post and indeed make sure every candidate meets my listed requirements. Honor, vigilance, loyalty, and most importantly, not a Phyrexian. Though at the end of the day, the only person I can be sure isn't a Phyrexian is me. Wait, what's this cord coming out of my arm? Yeah, it's probably nothing. Indeed knows that when you're doing everything for your company, you can't afford to overspend on hiring. Visit Indeed.com slash Command Zone to start hiring now. Just go to Indeed.com slash Command Zone. Again, Indeed.com slash Command Zone. Terms and conditions apply. Cost per application pricing not available for everyone. Need to hire? You need Indeed. And I pass the turn. Ugh, my hand is full of gas. It's just so expensive. Oh, I know. Gas is super expensive these days. My mana curve's pretty low. I'm just... Tired of overpaying at the pump? Trust me, I know how you feel. Do you? Luckily, there's a great way to get cash back whenever you pay for gas, groceries, or dining out. And that's Upside. Just this morning, I was refilling the tank, so I booted up the app, claimed an offer, and checked in at the gas station. Then Upside gave me money for the gas I was already buying. That is pretty cool, but as far as the game... Oh, with Upside, there are no games. It's as good as it sounds, and super easy to use. Plus, I'm getting way more cash back than I ever did from credit card rewards or loyalty programs. In fact, I got enough to play some drafts at my LGS. To get started, just download the free Upside app, use our promo code COMMAND, and get $5 or more cash back on your first purchase of $10 or more. Nice. So, can I take my turn now? Sure. Mm, I pass. Download the free Upside app and use promo code COMMAND to get $5 or more cash back on your first purchase of $10 or more. That's $5 or more cash back on your first purchase of $10 or more using promo code COMMAND. Whoa, easy there, buddy. Hey guys, it's me, Tatsunari Toad Rider. Now, I love bouncing around on my toad friend, Kami, but I'll say this, the ride is far from smooth. That's why when I want some bops while we hops, I use my Raycon wireless earbuds. Whether I'm listening to frog and roll music or a riveting historical podcast, Raycons deliver top tier audio quality at just half the price of other premium brands. And no matter how choppy the hopping gets, my Raycons never fall out thanks to their optimized gel tips for that perfect in-ear fit. Plus, with their super sleek design, the everyday earbuds look, feel, and sound better than ever. They truly are a croak of genius. 
And don't worry, with Raycon's eight hours of playtime and 32 hour battery life, my froggy friend can frolic to their heart's content and I'll be listening all the while. Turns out Raycons really are the total package. All right, all right, we'll see ourselves out. Hi ho, Kami! Right now, Command Zone listeners can get 15% off their Raycon order at buyraycon.com slash command. That's buyraycon.com slash command to save 15% on Raycons. Again, buyraycon.com slash command. All right, we're back. We are talking about the first half of the box topper commanders from Dominar United, A through R. We are up to J, my favorite letter. Is that even true? I feel like I had to say it because my name's Josh. Because your name's Josh, yeah. yeah but you is got, R like, your favorite letter? <laughs> I don't think so. Does anybody, do people even have favorite I'm letters? I'm kind of bored thing? of R. <laughs> <laughs> I use it a lot. <laughs> Maybe my favorite letter is Q. Letter. Yeah, I don't know. Just to be interesting. Okay, what a weird discussion. Um, <laughs> welcome back. Anyway, everybody, let's start uh, back up here with Jedit O'Janin, Mercenary. It is one in a white uh, sorry, one a white and a blue. So three mana for a three three cat mercenary legendary. Of course, whenever Jedit or another legendary creature enters the battlefield under your control, you may pay green. If you do, create a two two green cat warrior creature token with forest walk. So this is a bant commander because mm-hmm. it does have green in the rules text, like green mana symbol. Um, when I was first breaking this down, I have to admit, I was just like a Zorius at first. And I was like, well, wait, it has green. That makes it so oh, much better. Oh, man. That Add the strongest color. <laughs> yeah. I mean, okay. Blue has something to say about that. But still. Yeah. Uh, okay. So what were you thinking when you saw this card? Um, So I think you're going to need to stack the deck with legendaries just to start with. Uh, specifically inexpensive legendaries because you are adding to their cost, right? So you don't really want to have four and five drops. Because you need that extra green. Because you need the green to get the payoff from your commander. How good exactly is one green for a 2-2? Two, because two? that's kind of what Jedit is, right? If there was a card that said, pay green, 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 make two twos. It like would green be, colon, make a 2-2. Yeah, two, two. make a 2-2. Two, two, that's quite good. Quite good. But, but not this, broken, but right? This is not broken. And this, this is, is not also, that. I mean, it goes infinite with Rexian Halter. Uh, okay. <laughs> so it says green tap. <laughs> make a... Make a ah, so many two. things go green, go yeah. infinite with Rexian Halter. Yeah, yeah, that's true. That's Rexian Halter's fault. Yeah. It's not the biggest payoff for casting a legendary creature because that does feel like a big cost is including a legendary creature in your deck, casting it, and then adding to its mana cost does feel like a lot. Yeah, we should say it's legendary creatures matter, right? Because other legendary cards won't trigger Jedi. It only cares about creatures. So like you said, cheap legendary creatures kind of seem to be the order of the day just so that you can make sure you have mana left over. Yeah, so I, I think what you really want is like Yoshimaru is perfect oh, in gosh. this deck. <laughs> yeah. He is a one mana one one uh, that cares about other legendary permanents. I've seen Yoshimaru's that are like 15 15s by the Oh my gosh, too, yeah. And this deck is will be designed to make this a big dog. Yeah. Uh, I really like Niambi, esteemed speaker. This is another cheap legendary creature for a white and a blue. It's 2 1. When it enters the battlefield, you may return another target creature you control to its owner's hand, uh, which is cool. You can buy it back recast it with Jedit. Uh, oh, yeah, that's great. Right. You cat. get another trigger. Yeah. 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 Uh, if you do, you gain life equal to that creature's converted mana cost. Uh, and it also says discard a legendary card. You can draw two cards. So it's yeah. got some of that legendary sub-theme. Um, there's Livio, who's two mana for a 2-2, two, two, but it has an, uh, flicker abilities on it. It's a little bit complicated. I won't go through it, but that is kind of has to do with Jedit, right? Because it's entering the battlefield. Yes. So if you can flicker a creature, it'll come back. And it will re-trigger yeah. Jedit. Jedit is an ETB, not a cast trigger. Which is nice. Yeah. Uh, so stuff like can... Anafenza, Kintry Spirit, feels like it'll be good. It's white, white for nice a 2-2. Nice cheap. Yeah, whenever another non-token creature uh, enters the battlefield under your control, you bolster one. So you put a 1-1 counter on your smallest creature, kind of. And that's really great, because kind of like Yoshimaru, comes out, gets you a cat, and mm-hmm. then as you play the rest of your legendary creatures, as you flicker them and stuff, which we're about to talk about, mm-hmm. they just start growing your other things. Um, yeah. So, yeah, that seems like a good first step of your plan. Uh, we have Jorel, one volley recluse. Which, Super cool. Yeah. Uh, also makes cats. Yeah, that's what I was going to say. <laughs> makes cats, makes two, two <laughs> cats, pumps all your your stuff as well, is sort of your crater hoof effect. Yep. Um, is a cheap legendary herself. Yeah, so that seems a shoe in to me in the Absolutely. deck. Absolutely. Yeah. Uh, Truck had a really interesting uh, thing that he added to the notes, which is that 
legendary creatures are historic. Mm -hmm. So the next category I'm calling historic help. So if you're going to play legendary creatures, you could play some of these historic payoff cards or historic enablers. Sure. Yeah. So Jojo is familiar. Historic spells you cast cost one less to cast. And you can use it to spend that green and get another cap. Yeah. So you basically now like just play the casting cost of the legendary creature. And as long as one of them are green, Jordan's Familiar kind of gives you that extra mana yeah. to pay for the cat. Yep. Mm-hmm. Uh, Raph Capuchin makes historic spells have flash. So it's like a Vidalcan Ori. And it's also a legendary creature that can trigger Jet It. Mm-hmm. Teshar brings oh, things love. back. Uh, from the graveyard when you cast the sport spells, uh, three CMC or less, right? Which is going to be good because all your legendaries are cheap, hopefully. Yeah, that's true. If Yoshimaru dies, well, all you have to do is cast a historic spell with Teshar out. Yep. Bring Yoshimaru back, trigger jet it, make the cat. Make cat. Yep. Uh, a lot of people saying Captain Sisse, of course, mm-hmm. is, this is not historic, but legendary matters. Um, yeah, make sure you always have another creature, a uh, legendary creature in your hand. Find the best ones. Mm-hmm. I mean, it's a tutor for legendaries. Reki was a uh, mono green legendary, or still is. Mono green legendary matters. Going to work yeah. in this deck too. Whenever you uh, cast a legendary spell, draw a card. Yep. So these all seem like they're good pieces in this deck. And then let's get to the blink flicker aspect of it. Because I think the only real way I can see to make a lot of cats yes. is going to be through blink flicker. Because that's yep. how... Reusing these ETBs. Um, Yeah, because just spending mana to cast spells and then spending more mana to make cats. I need those. I need some part of that to be very, very cheap or free. It's also so like a board wipe absolutely wrecks that plan. You've invested a ton of mana into getting, you know, like three cats and three legendary creatures on the board. A board wipe sets you a long way back. So being able to reuse that legendary creature over and over again um, to make more cats means you're not as overcommitted to the board. So Teleportation Circle, Conjurer's Closet, Thosset, D- Deep Dwelling, these are all ways on your end step to flicker one of your legendary creatures. Comes back in, you pay the green. So these kind of say every turn at least pay a green, get a 2-2 as long as you have another legendary creature out. I thought Cloudstone Curio might be a piece of a... Yeah. Because if you start thinking like, how do I break it now? Yeah. How could I create infinite cats or just, you know, 100 cats? Yeah. It, it's hard to put this together, but I think one of the pieces might be Cloudstone Curio because if I have two legendary creatures that cost very little, yes, I play one, I pay the green, yeah, and then I bounce another one that costs one, right, and then I play that one, I bounce the first one that costs one, and as long as I can keep, create I mean, mana in there, and if you keep sacking the cats, so if you have a mana doubler and Phyrexian altar, yeah, or a token doubler, token, yeah, token, yeah, doubler, that's what I meant, um, yeah. Yeah, you, so you could probably also cats. deal with like we're going to talk about it in a second, but like Earthcraft maybe might be a piece of that too. For sure, yeah. If you had like a bounce land in Earthcraft, maybe you could do it. Yeah. Oh no, that it only does basic lands. You'd have to have like a market festival or something. Anyway, Phyrexian Altar plus Annoying Procession is probably easier. Yeah, Phyrexian yeah. Altar makes sure that you always have green to buy to buy another cat. Which is and cool. if you're paying one green for two cats, now all of a sudden, let's say you play Higher, yeah. you play Hope of Girapur with Cloudstone Career out, you bounce your Ovia Pashiri. Uh, Hope. Cannot trigger Cloudstone. Oh, it's an artifact. artifact. Oh, you need a <laughs> you need another one mana legend. Is there another one? <laughs> Yoshimaru? There you go. Yeah. Okay. Yoshimaru and Ovio Pashiri, and you just, you know, every time you play one, you bounce the other, but that's an ETB. Oh boy. You have to jump through a lot of hoops to make this broken, which I think is interesting. Yeah. I actually like those commanders. Mm-hmm. And these are the ones I like to point out to people like, hey, your play group's always killing you first because your decks are too good. Build Jedit because hey, it's hard yeah. to make the Jedit deck broken unless. Don't just do the thing where you build a, take a CEDH shell and put Jetta at the head. You have to build around Jet, what Jetta wants to do. Yeah, I think I think if you're if you're having a tough time building low power decks, you take a bad plan and you try and make it work as well as possible. So you just start with a bad thesis. <laughs> yeah, I have to play legendary spells and then pay mana for two twos. For cats. Yeah. Now what? Now, as long uh, as I, yeah, <laughs> just do the best version of that. It's probably not going to be a ten out of ten, right? Yeah, for sure. Um, okay, so blue white. It has a lot of blink synergy, mm-hmm. has all the token synergy, right? All the way to a- Adrix and Nev, has a lot of token doublers. We're going to talk about tokens all the time on this episode. So, Catharsis Crusade, Annoying Procession, Parallel Lives, Doubling Season, you got it. There's another way to go, possibly, with this deck that you pointed out, which is Cat Warrior Tribal. Yeah, I think I think if you're building Jeddit, you love Jeddit. Right. And you're really into what he does and what that character is. So, I think you could really lean into it. And there's a ton of of payoffs for for cats there's now. lots of cats they stuff they keep for sure, making yeah. cat stuff but there's also some really cool uh warrior stuff uh i like norika 
uh, Yamazaki, the poet, which is the uncommon samurai, the white samurai from Kamigawa. It's so whenever a samurai or warrior you control attacks alone, uh, you may cast target enchantment from your graveyard this turn. So you could buy back an anointed procession or a doubling mm-hmm. season or any of those token things we were talking about before. Uh, God Eternal, like Oketra, the four, when you cast a creature spell, she makes a 4-4 four, four black zombie warrior token. With vigilance. With vigilance. So the cat, the cats are cat warriors. These are warriors. Uh, there they're are tokens. So token tokens synergies work. Yeah, that's nice. They can sort of do this. Uh, another legendary permanent that makes warriors is Oketra's Monument is very powerful. It also reduces the casting cost, gives you the green to make the cats. You got it. Warrior it, Tribal, you might be selling me a little. I, I kind of love it. Uh, whenever you cast a creature spell, you create a 1-1 white warrior creature token with vigilance. Vigilance. So there are there are a lot of ways to make a lot of warriors. And, a lot of cross synergy there. Oketra is a, yeah. a, a legendary creature. Oketra's mm-hmm. monument is a legendary artifact. So yeah, yeah, I like that a lot. There's so I think if you dig down deep and you're like, you know what, I'm gonna con- this is gonna be my casual deck. It's gonna be combat based. I'm gonna lean into like the warrior tribal synergy, or I'm gonna lean into the legendary tribal synergy, or I'm gonna lean into the cat tribal synergy, and you can really make something kind of kind of fun and neat. Yeah. Okay, that's cool. Uh, for the cat stuff, well, there's lots of cat stuff. Seeka's uh, chariot. Yeah, Kahira. Kahira. Yeah. Uh, Kahira could be your companion. companion. That's interesting. Kolvori is interesting because on the other side of Kolvori is the Ringheart Crest, which I think kind of can go in any version of this. Yeah. Yeah, it's one in a green for a legendary artifact. When it enters the battlefield, you choose a creature type. So you can choose warrior, you can choose cat. Um, and then you tap it to add uh, green and you spend this mana only to cast a creature spell of the chosen type or a legendary creature spell. So yeah. it's a two mana rock that kind of works in a bunch of different ways with your deck and is legendary. So that's nice. Um, something truck pointed out he put here was that Yavamaya cradle of growth. It's a legendary land. This is each land is a force in addition to its other types. Don't forget the cat warriors that Jedit makes are, uh, they do have forest walk. Mm-hmm. So that would just immediately make your team unblockable, which is kind of funny. That's what a, I, what I love con- about that is holding that in your yeah. hand until you have a board and they're like, whatever we're doing over there and then slamming it, your board's unblockable and, yeah. and you're in big trouble. And they're like, Oh no, I have war dead now. Instead yeah. of just Crop rotation is, yeah. like could put it into play. It's yeah, that's cool. great. Okay. Oh, hobby Calaria. Yeah. So I don't even remember. Though this is Lady Calaria. Is it Lady Calaria? It must be, right? Is she is she an archer? I mean, she's got to be. Uh, so Ohabi Calaria is one of the, uh, is an elf archer. Uh, a 1-3 with reach for one, a green and a white. Uh, it says untap all archers you control during each other player's untap step. I like untapping things. Pretty powerful. Whenever an archer you control deals damage to a creature, you may pay two if you do draw a card. Okay, first off, I want to say I was right. It is Lady Calaria. Nailed it. Yeah. And I then this one. Yeah, I remember the art. Oh my god, it's so expensive. <laughs> so, it's a seven mana. Is it an archer? Three six. Seven mana three six. You is an it archer, archer though, yeah. Pretty good. Taps to deal three damage, start attacking your blocking creature, which is very archery, as we'll find out. That's the old one. The new one's way better. Okay, so Archer Tribal. Yeah, right. Because so we've got to talk about the archers in that exist. Yeah, because Ohabi Calaria does not interact with non-archers in any way. No, it only cares about archers. And I, my thought when I saw that was like, because we haven't had a lot of archer tribal. No, was well, what are archer? Like, I don't know much about what they really do in Magic. I couldn't think of any archers offhand. Like, if you had told me to just name an archer, yeah, yeah. I had none. I would say Torwaki only because of recent. Right, recently. but that's Raptos. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> so what is the archer identity was the question that yeah. we kind of posed. And so there are 64 archers only in green-white. To put that in perspective, there are 381 elves in green-white. So we are at, you know, one, what, what is that? The sixth of the amount of elves. There are 252 birds in blue-white. Just to give you an idea of how low 64 is. Yeah. I kept, like, thinking, like, well, how many... How many fairies are there in blue black? There's 79. Okay, that's still higher. It's about the same amount of uh, one tribe as there are spiders, just period. So spiders are in green, black, and red, and yeah. there are 66 spiders. Have you seen very many spider tribal decks out there? Not that many. Right? Not many. Yeah. It's... So that's the level we're at here. The archers are, there's 64 of them. Most of them aren't great. Yeah, I mean, there are very few. I wonder how many rare archers there are. I can't imagine there being much more than five. (laughs) So of the 64 archers in green-white, because again, 
the only thing I really thought was I think rear archers usually have reach. Reach for sure. Yeah. That's that was the was the first thing I would think about. And there are forty five of them that have reach, or they have like old school reach, which means they don't say reach on the card, but they say can block creatures with flying. Right. Yeah, because uh, a lot of archers are old. Yeah. There are nineteen of them that have some kind of tap ability. So I'd say that's kind of this one third of them or yeah. so. And then there are eight that care about one one counters. And that was the only unifying things I could find. So they have reach. Some of them have a tap abilities, and yeah. then some very like what one eighth of them have one one counter synergies. Right. One thing you kind of penned, which I think was the same line of thinking as me, uh, was that there were a decent amount of pingers yeah. among the archers. So they just like original Lady Calaria, tap to deal three damage, target attacking or blocking creature. There is stuff like crossbow infantry, which is one in a white for a one one human soldier, but it's been uh, errated to Archer. You can tap it and it deals one damage to target attacking or blocking creature. That's like the most simple version of what you'll sort of see some variant of that on a lot of archers. Right. That seems to be the theme is you're you're not dealing damage just to any creature. It's an attacking or, or blocking creature most often. Yep. Uh, that's the same as Bridget, Hero of Kins Bale. She is a 2-3 with first strike and has an activated ability that deals two damage to each attacking creature or blocking creature target player controls. So I think she's one of the better archers. For sure. Two is a lot. And this yeah. is not a, you know, four, at least she's a four CMC card, not an insane, yeah. not seven mana. Like and it's to all attacking creatures. Yeah. And the other thing you'll sort of see is it's either that cares about attacking or blocking or cares about that it's flying. It can only hit flyers. Right. That too. Yeah. So Matsu Tribe Sniper is one in a green for a one, one. You tap it and it deals one damage to target creature with flying. That creature doesn't have to be attacking or blocking. It just has to be flying. Mm -hmm. uh, it also says whenever Matsu Tribe Sniper deals damage to a creature, tap that creature, and it doesn't untap during its control next untap. Them. So it sleeps them. Right. Yeah. yeah. It's it's a it's a tranquilizer art <laughs> arrow. <laughs> Terrifying. Yes. I mean, that's cool. It's a snake archer. Yeah. That makes sense. It tranks you, yeah. Uh scattershot archer is one green for a one, two. You tap it and it deals one damage to each creature with flying. So that when I see that, First, I think everybody yeah. thinks the same thing when they're like, okay, well, it's going to deal one damage to a bunch of, you know, creatures, all the creatures right. with flying. Well, what do I want to do with that? I want to give it death touch. Yeah, of course. Uh, yeah. If you're only going to deal one damage, that's not going to kill most stuff in Commander. So you you really do need to give these guys death touch to to make a big impact. But Bridget with death touch is really sweet. Yeah. It's, you can you can kill all attacking creatures. So stuff like uh, Basilisk Collar and Gorgon's Head are both uh, equipment that give the equipped creature either death touch, uh, death touch in lifelink and Basilisk's Collar case and <laughs> just death touch on with Gorgon's Head. Yeah, it's harder to give your whole team death touch than you would think, because a lot of the stuff Especially that gives Death one. Touch, like Bow of Nylea, is Death Touch your attacking creatures. Right. That doesn't help you because I want to tap my creatures to do this thing. <laughs> right. uh, Sarath does do it because it says other tapped creatures you control have Death Touch. And the interesting thing is I have to tap my creature to deal the one damage. So when the damage happens, it will be tapped. Right. The tap is the cost, the resolution. Yeah. It is already tapped. But Oren, uh, fast, Oren, Fra Oren Frostfang got there. <laughs> uh, only affects attacking creatures. Yeah. Um, uh, there's a couple cards that don't have Death Touch, but they're basically the same, right? They sort of Caldra. Essentially, yeah, essentially Death Touch. It's uh, sort of Caldra exiles when it deals damage to them. Yeah, yes. whenever equipped creature deals damage to a creature, remove that creature from the game, exile that creature, yep. Mm -hmm. uh, and then Nico Tay. I'm not sure exactly how to say it, but it's whenever equipped creature deals damage to a creature, tap that creature. As long as Nico Tay remains in play, that creature doesn't untap during its controller's untap step. So it sleeps it until it, until it wakes up. Yep, taps it down forever. Yeah. Yeah. I wanted to talk about how this ability of like tap and deal damage to an attacking a rocking creature mm -hmm. is like way less good than like say Tim, who just reaches out and taps and deals one damage, doesn't care. To anything. Right. Because what'll happen is if you have a basilisk collar on your Bridget, they just will not attack. Mm -hmm. Right? Yeah. People they can see it. It's not like it's hidden. So they're not going to do the thing. So I was like, is there a way to make them attack? in these colors, which by the way, red's really good at this, but not green, white. They're a peaceful color. Pattern. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. White's not forcing people to attack. That's not really their thing. So there are some ways to do it roundabout ways to maybe, and I don't know, maybe these go in the deck like bull whip is one mana for an artifact. You pay to tap it and it deals one damage to target creature. That creature attacks this turn if able. I will kill it. Yeah. <laughs> I will pay 12 mana to do so, but I will do it. Oh, I said two mana. Did I said one mana for an artifact. It's four mana for an artifact. 
Sorry, the glare got me on that one. Uh, <laughs> yeah, it's four mana to cast, two mana to activate. So six uh, mana. My personal favorite, Angel's Trumpet. Uh, attacking does not cause creatures to tap. Cool. You could attack with your archers and then use them later. Yeah, yeah. Cool. At the end of each player's uh, turn, tap all untapped creatures he or she controls that did not attack this turn. Angel's Trumpet deals one damage to that player for each creature tapped this way. So it doesn't exactly force them to attack, but it incentivizes them. It strongly encourages. Yeah, it puts them in a position where at least something bad will happen if they don't. Yes. Um, you put, you had an interesting thing, which was like maybe it's there's an enrage aspect to the deck. It where gives you a little bit more control over it if you're a trying lot to more. deal damage to your own creatures. Yeah. Right? Um, so, yeah, I liked Enrage, which is sort of weird as archers and dinosaurs fighting in your own deck. Wasn't that the Ikoria trailer? It was Vivian shooting arrows at a dinosaur, I, I mean, think, though. So, yeah. We're doing it. We're building uh, a narrative. <laughs> so things like Ranging Raptors uh, is a three mana, two, three with Enrage. It's whenever it's dealt damage. You may search your library for a basic land card, put it into the battlefield, tapped, and then shuffle your library. So you attack with it, use your pingers to ping it, and then you can... Um, you know, use them later. Do rampant growth, yeah. Yeah, if it's good against your opponents. A uh, Ripjaw Raptor. You could even probably do it if you had enough where you're like, attack, before blocks, ping it, get a thing. Yeah. Uh, declare blockers, ping it, get another thing. You, you could hit, you can hit this thing twice for one. Of course, they might block it then, so you have to be a little careful. But, yeah, but then at least, you know, you get two lands. And you get a third land, right? Yeah. Because you ping it, get the land then, and then it would get hit by the creature. So I think that's okay. fine. Three mana, get three lands. What's the artifact that turns everything into all creatures? That turns everything into creatures. Into changelings. Uh, Masquid Nexus? Masquid Nexus. Yeah. So you turn your dinosaurs into, into archers. archers. And, then and then you untap them every turn. <laughs> <laughs> and if you block, you can ping them again. There you go. And get lands. I don't know. I think there's something there. Uh, Ripjaw Raptor is another good run. Whenever it's dealt damage, you draw, draw a card. card. Uh, Siege Horn Ceratops whenever it's dealt damage put a plus one counter on it put two counters on it excuse me uh, Rite of Passage is an en enchantment for three that says whenever a creature you control is dealt damage put a plus one counter on it which is like pseudo and rage bigger, right? stuff so you can ping your own archers to put counters on them grow them there's, there's stuff you can do but you are gonna have to work for it <laughs> that seems like a lot of hoops to jump through yeah um I wanted to look at what notably really bad with the death touch synergy. Yeah, you don't don't do both of those things in the same deck for sure. Their pinging is not the only thing that archers do. There are some decent archers that have like other abilities. So there's like Elvish Hunter, one in a green um, for a one one, but you can pay one in a green, tap it. Target creature doesn't untap during its controller's next untap step. There's Halana, Kest Ranger. She's four mana for a three four with reach. She is an archer. Whenever another creature enters the battlefield under your control, you may pay two. When you do, that creature deals damage equal to its power to start creature, so not a fight, a punch spell. Or I suppose an arrow mm -hmm. shooting spell. <laughs> so there are some other abilities on creatures that might matter. Great Bow Doyen is four and a green for a two four. Other archers get plus one, plus one. And then whenever an archer you control deals damage to a creature, that archer deals that much damage to that creature's controller. That's pretty cool. Yeah. There is uh, Dalsim the pliable pacifist. Now, Dalsum is a monk, not an archer, but has reach and says, um, whenever a creature you control with reach attacks, untap it, and it can't be blocked by creatures with greater power this combat. That's sweet. Archers tend to have low power. Um, and reach? Yep. And it says, whenever one or more creatures you control deal combat damage to player, draw a card. Very powerful. So I think probably belongs in the deck. Mm -hmm. All this stuff we're talking about is not very powerful, right? Like, it's... Yeah, um, I think if you're doing this, you, you're really committed to the character or really committed to archers. Maybe you're an archer. Um, I, I there, think there's I th maybe an interesting deck that really leans on Masquid Nexus and is like green white activated abilities. Yeah, and you just turn all of them into archers, uh, and then you can untap them every turn. It's like having Seedborn Muse in the command zone, but you are you are definitely putting in the effort to to make this a deck. Yeah, I, I think the untap clause is the thing we haven't really explored that much here, and that's right. probably the more powerful part. Mm -hmm. uh, even with archers, if you could just give all your archers tap abilities, yeah, then you can really start doing some stuff. So Cryptolith right immediately turns this into yeah. like extra into Seaborn Muse, into basically. Seaborn Muse, yeah, yeah. So now you can tap all your archers as mana dorks, and they untap on everybody's turn. Very cool. So if you have ways to sort of use that mana, and there are a number of cards that will simulate Cryptolith right. There's Earthcraft, which Earth, we talked about yeah. earlier. There's Sitinel Herophants. There's Ashaya, Soul of the Wild, that turns, turns all of them all. Yeah, Force cool. as well. So now 
if you just get one of those cards and, you know, one of two of them are creatures, which, you know, green can find creatures if they need to. I was going to say you are in green and white. So you do have access to a lot of creature tutors, uh, which and I think tutors for crypto is right. From that white. too. Yeah. yeah. Uh, or I, which you're probably going to have to lean on pretty hard. Uh, to, to make this go. Yeah, but, but as soon as you start that, now all of a sudden, okay, well, I've got three or four creatures, but they're mana dark, so now I can use them every turn. Yeah. That sounds like a thing that will actually be quite powerful. Absolutely. Takes they also a little do time tend to, to be up. cheap, so you can get all these archers into play and then have instants or pass for that. Yeah, and there's also like Rishkar, Jung and Gu, which put one-on-one counters on stuff, but say the stuff with one-on-one counters can tap as though they were mana dorks, mm-hmm. that you can do stuff like that. Uh, I was looking for anything else that gives a tap ability. There's Presence of Gond, which is two and a green enchanted a creature. Uh, you can tap the creature to make a 1-1 one, one elf warrior creature token. Okay. What about warrior tribal? <laughs> <laughs> well, I keep making everything You didn't think elf tribal? tribal? Yeah, you didn't think elf tribal? Maybe when no, I saw no, warrior. no, it's warriors. <laughs> but that's actually pretty good. Presence yeah, of Gond, of right? Because you you're going to get one. four. Mm-hmm. You put it, tap it on the next turn, tap it on the next turn, tap it like, that. Convoke spells are also quite good in this yes. category. There's some Convoke instants um, that you can use your creatures. Court of Calling to, to get calling your really Ashaya. Good. March of Multitudes. Yeah. Is that, I think that's an instant. Yep. So those are ways, and I think that's really what you're probably going to do. You might have like a Basilisk Caller, and you're like, you can really keep everybody at bay. Mm-hmm. Kind of like real archers. Like, just don't come close. Otherwise, yeah. you're going to look like a pincushion. People will stay away, give you a little time to set up, and then all of a sudden you go, you know, uh, Cryptolith right, Vidalcan go. Pretty and good. they're like, oh, crap. Now we're in trouble. Yeah, yeah, now it's unlimited mana, and any deck can win with unlimited mana, right? Not infinite, unlimited. Something I want to point out really quick, because I've seen this mistake made uh, quite a few times, mm-hmm. which is that there are cards that are very similar to um, Ohabi Kalaria, which s- lets you untap things during your opponent's untap step. So Drum Bellower, Quest for Renewal, Seedworm is the, the best one in the classic one. Mm-hmm. These are not triggers, so you can't stack them. So they all say untap something during your opponent's, or sorry, during each player's untap step. That, it doesn't say at the beginning of their untap right. step, untap your stuff. So they will not stack. So if you have Drum Bellower and Ohabi Kalaria out, just one. You don't get to untap your archers twice mm-hmm. because nothing, no triggers or anything can happen during the untap step, actually. That would have to be during the upkeep. So. I'm not saying don't play drum bell or maybe you do just have a backup for your commander, but yeah. you you don't all of a sudden get to double up the amount of times you can tap your uh, untap your archers on everybody's turn. Yeah. Just be aware of that. Yeah. All right. The next one yeah. is a seven CMC <laughs> commander. <laughs> This is a, she's a big lady. Uh, she is. This, this is Orca Siege Demon. For five black red, you can have a five five legendary demon with trample. It says whenever another creature dies, put a plus one plus one counter on Orca Siege Demon. And whenever Orca dies, it deals damage equal to its power divided as you choose among any number of targets. Okay, so it's like Rakdos Aristocrats Voltron. It's, it's a seven drop. Seven so many. Um, that was the thing. I, like, I kind of like the text, but then when I saw that at seven CMC, I was like, oh. It's going to be, and it requires, like, in order for it to be better, stuff has to happen after this. That's so, the weird thing about this. Like, I would way rather yeah. it was a four man, a three, three, no trample. Yeah. Or it know? doesn't get plus one, plus one counters when things die. Or sure. Something like just that. something, make it small. But at least then I can play it and then do the things because it seems very hard. To, to play this and then have enough time left in the game to make any number of creatures die so that this is relevant. Yeah, like you sort of, the, you'd have to spend the early game building up all your tokens and that, and then get it in play and have a free sack outlet. But and, everyone, that's tel- so telegraph, right? Oof. Like everybody sees it coming. They've calculated it into the... Yeah. Yes. It's way better to play commander or have cards in your hand that they don't know about and, do right. the, and then now do the things. Right. Um, so there, there's definitely some trouble with Orca. Um, there are some cool things that you can do. You knew, do need to like recognize you have a seven CMC commander, and you need to prepare for that. So the deck's going to need a ton of ramp, probably a ton of rituals. Um, but, I think you're really going to have to like focus like a good part of the deck on cheating or in a play, or right. or and and by cheat I mean not for free, but just like you know you're going to play dark ritual like you said. Yeah, a lot of decks don't play it, but this deck almost has to because you don't actually care if she dies and goes to the graveyard. You can get her back out of there a lot easier than paying the seven mana to cast her for sure. 
Um, so lots of ways to cheat her into play. Uh, I think Hellkite Courser is kind of neat. I mean, it's six CMC, but this is great if you're if you've already cast her from the command zone. Uh, Hellkite Courser on ETB allows you to put a commander you control you own, excuse me, from the command zone onto the battlefield. It gains haste, return it to the command zone at the beginning of the next end step. So sneak attacks out your yeah, it it sneaks it into play for one turn. Um, so you need a sack outlet to get that dice trigger on Orca, um, but you do get a turn into play and it makes it cheaper yeah you're probably playing you know stuff like command begins to get it into your hand early Mm -hmm. um you kind of just want it in the bin you kind of want to get it into the graveyard so you can reanimate it so you can animate that yeah so but i think if you got it into your hand you know again yeah thrill possibilities faithless looting red decks just routinely play right five or six ways to discard cards so you're like get it into my hand and I'll get it into the bin. And then, yeah, I can get it out for one or two mana with Animate Dead and Reanimate. Seems like a better plan than, like, somehow pay seven. I guess, you know, Dark Ritual, maybe you play Jewel Lotus or something in the deck. I'm loath to tell people to play that card. But when you're seven CMC commander that's not even that powerful, I think you probably are fine yeah, to yeah, play that's, it. Yeah, uh, <laughs> that's just fine, honestly. If you need to have four mana in play yeah. for Jewel Lotus to, <laughs> to be, be good, good, you're fine. Yeah, yeah don't worry about it. Uh, <laughs> go nuts. Then, of course, once Orca's out, the order of the day on the card says, you know, you need to make stuff die. The, really do. Yeah, which is p- part of the problem. You want to get it out early so you can have a, f- a number of turns to make stuff die. Edict Effects, Black's really good at it. Merciless mm-hmm. Executioner, Fleshbag Marauder. Those are on creatures, which are nice because they will die sacking themselves, getting mm-hmm. more counters on Orca. But you can also do that on Instants and Sorceries. Uh, I really like Soul Shatter. I think I think this card's just kind of underplayed. It says each opponent sacrifices a creature or planeswalker with the highest converted mana cost among creatures of planeswalkers they control. Yeah, always so, kind of gets their best thing. Yeah, so a lot of the time the issue with with like a Fleshback Marauder kind of thing is they'll just sack a token or they'll sack the whatever creature they need the least. But Soul Shatter makes sure that it, you hit something real. Uh, and Vona's Hunger is sweet and can hit a lot of creatures. Yeah. Uh, so it says each opponent sacrifices a creature if you have the city's blessing. Instead, each opponent sacrifices half the creatures he or she controls rounded up. So you can, if you can just cast this, you can get a few counters on, on yeah, Orca six, and, seven, and your movement. Easily. Yeah. Yeah. That's pretty nice. Um, I thought small damage based board wipes might be really good in this deck. For one, mm-hmm. you're going to be spending your early turns probably trying to figure out how to get Orca into a place where you can cast it. Mm. So you probably won't have a ton of board presence. You don't want to play a lot of your creatures super early. You know, Fleshbite Marauder, you want to wait till after Orca's out. So you're probably not playing it unless you're under dire threat. And man, the format is just so much more rife now with small creatures that matter, right? It is. It didn't used to matter that much, but now with the Timnas and the Ragavans and the, you know, yeah, the the face breakers and the there's a just lot of the way that, that void they walkers. balance spells for other uh, eternal formats is by making them little yeah. and commander doesn't really care if they're little. So people run them regardless. So sometimes these pyroclasms are a lot more powerful. Like, you know, they, if you take out an Esper Sentinel and a Douthy Voidwalker, that is worth the spell. Yeah. So pyroclasm is a great one. Anger of the Gods does three to everything. Pyroclasms too. Sweltering Suns I really like because it does three to everything, but it also has cycling three. So when you draw it later in the game, maybe you could turn it into another card. Pyrohemia and Pestilence could be really good. I really like Pyrohemia and Pestilence and uh, Aether Flash uh, because you can play them before Orca. Yeah. Um, and you they're good in play. It gives you something to do with those turns before you have seven mana to get Orca into play. Yeah, because Orca is a 5-5 five, five that's going to get bigger. So yeah. if you Pyrohemia for two and it kills a couple of things the damage marked on Orca won't kill her and Pyrohemia and Pestilence will stick around. Ether yeah. Flash is uh, an enchantment that just says whenever a creature comes into play, it takes two damage. So just that doesn't actually kill things. That just stops things from being played is what happens. Sure. Yeah. yeah. So, Cause no one's play. every once in a while somebody would be like, okay, I'm still going to dock side. Uh, right. But yeah. stuff like that. Yeah. Um, and then of course, I think you can make her really, really big by some of the aristocrats combos we're used to. Right. So Gravecaller, Phyrexian Altar, that's a way to just continuously sack the same creature. Nether Trader can kind of do similar things. Reassembling Skeleton, you know, add in all your Aristocrats pieces like Pillars Plunderer and Viserysir, Viserysir, sorry. Um, that that soup of like Blood Artists and Zulipor Cutthroats and all the stuff we normally see yep. is probably going to create the situation where Orca just gets infinitely large. Yeah. I mean, Blood Artists would probably kill people in that situation regardless. Yeah, I that's I feel like if you're doing that, you should play Jury or you should play Judith or like one of the the ones that leads to that. But if you want to make Orca infinitely large, 
that's really going to, you need to be able to do it with the turn that Orca comes down. So one of these combos is uh, going to be really You helpful. can do it the turn after, I think, because yeah. people are probably aren't going to be like, oh, Orca's out. Oh, We're all dead. Yeah, me. exactly. We're all dead. <laughs> oh, but no. then you go, Grave Crawler for X and Alter, like, oh, crap. Sack, 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 sack. Yeah. Sack the Orca at the end of it. Split my million damage, you know, a third of a million to each of you. Yep. Yeah, that's a thing that probably can happen. Mm. There's other ways to make her huge, though, and I think it's easy to miss that the fact that she gets the one-on-one counters doesn't have to be the reason that she's big. Yeah. You can just play equipment and things that are going to make her really, really big. Yeah. Uh, I, uh, it's really good with, with you want her to be really big if right. you're playing this kind of thing. So a Black Blade Reforged is really good. You can double uh, her ability with a Ghost Lantern. It's just a, another thing that says whenever a creature dies, you put a plus one counter on it. Um, I like an equipment like Lash Ride oh, yeah. uh, because it equips for free. This one's so nice. It's a four mana equipment uh, living weapon. Uh, so when it ETBs, it's got a boy on it, but it says equipped creature gets plus one, plus one for each swamp you control. And the equip cost is Phyrexian Black, Phyrexian Black. So it's you can paid for life. cast, yeah. So you can cast uh, Orca, equip it for free, and you already have a big Orca on the battlefield the turn that you cast it. Yeah, and this deck's definitely playing Urbor. So yes. very possibly that's like, you know, plus eight, plus eight to Orca. So that is a really good way to get her like really big kind of quickly. And mm-hmm. also the fact that Last Rite kind of sits around, you can bring Orca back because you'll probably like sack her, use reanimate to bring her back out or animate dead. Equip again. Equip Last Rite again. So you can actually be like, oh, I'm going to, it's going to do 15 or 20 every time I sack it. But I can sack it three times this turn. Right. Kill, that, you know, kill the two of you or whatever. That free equip is huge. And yeah. getting it on the board uh, before Orca is, is going to be really important. There's also things like Fane the Broker, who is you sacrifice a creature to put two 1-1 one, one counters on target creatures. So this is a way to sort of turn your aristocrats into three counters onto Orca. Mm-hmm. Uh, Fane's really cool in this Yeah. Thing. Unleash Fury. Yeah. This is a card we both kind of pegged. And I think could be super powerful. You put a Lash Rite on and it's like, okay, mildly scary. Then you say, yeah, but I'm going to play Unleash Thir- Fury, which is one in red for an instant. Double the power of target creature until like, turn. So you're going to deal 22 damage yeah. rather than 11? Now it's an existential threat. Yes, for sure. Uh, and anything that can double the power, it only needs to be doubled one time. So uh, I think Unleash Fury is going to be super sweet. Uh, another big pump spell that always works in decks like this is one of my favorites. It's Hatred mm-hmm. for five. For three, black, black, you can pay X life. Target creature gets plus X plus O until end of turn. So if there's a board wipe, if somebody goes to remove your commander, you can take that moment, make it really big, uh, spend a bunch of life to do so, but dome your opponents for just as much. Yeah, I mean, this can be an instant kill spell. For sure. Very often. And the problem there is that you only get to sort of take out one player. Yeah. Because... Well, you can divvy up Orca's damage. Right. But, I mean, they would have to be at much right. lower much life total lower. than you started because you're paying life into of hatred. Course, yeah. But there are ways to sort of turn that into double um, again. So, like, Fling. Mm-hmm. Uh, yep. So, Fling is a card you just sacrifice a creature and it deals damage to any target equal to that creature's power. So, imagine you Fling Orca when it has, you know, you've unleashed Fury on it or you've hatred it and it has, like, 30 power. You're going to deal 30 when it dies from its ability and then 30 from the Fling. Yeah. So, you turn 30 into 60 that way. Yeah. Um, so in, instead of like looping Orca, it's just one one big shot. Yeah. Uh, Kazul's Fury is a really great version of Fling awesome. because it's on a land because it's an MDFC. So that's a good one to play that's kind of free. Uh, Chandra's Ignition is another card that kind of works with in a similar way where you get Orca big enough and then it's a sorcery that costs five target creature you control deals damage equal to its power to each other creature and each opponent. So you don't even lose Orca in this case. A lot of times Chandra's Ignition can be you know, hatred onto Orca, you know, pay 20 life. She's 25, 25. Mm-hmm. Chandra's ignition it, kills everybody, hits everything for 25, then swing for the 25 to finish off the last player. And it kills all the other creatures. creatures yeah. So it makes Orca, Orca Even really big. Chandra's, Chandra's ignition is great in this deck. Yep. So that is uh, a pretty good like roadmap for how to get it big enough. And then we've been talking about like sacking Orca multiple times in turn. And I think you're going to probably play a bunch of cards there's a bunch of cards in black that basically say when this creature dies, bring it back out. 
There's a ton of these that are uh, the one mana ones, I think, in particular, are really good because your commander is so expensive. Uh, Malakir Rebirth is another MDFC. It uh, will bring Orca back when she dies. Kaya's Ghost Form is an aura form of this for, for one black. Uh, notably, uh, Kaya's Ghost Form triggers when she leaves the battlefield, I believe. No, when Enchanted Permanent no, it's just dies, dies or is put into or exile. Or is put into exile. Yeah. I knew there was two options. So if it gets swords or something and you don't have a sack outlet, it does bring it back still. So Kaya's Ghost Form is is real good in this deck yeah i balance your rebirth i play in basically every black i deck. love it that so good. Insane. yeah it's there's really no reason not to run it because it's a land on the other side yeah especially yeah. if you're running sack outlets it's just it feels really good in hand you feel very safe um i found one called shades form that i quite like it's one black black for an enchant creature it has that clause when enchanted creature is uh dies return that creature to the battlefield under your control cool. but it also says pay a black give enchanted creature gets plus one plus one so it's that uh it's it's like fire breathing, but the black version. Very cool. It's like yeah. shade. So now I can shade pump form. Orca yeah. a lot with my football coffers and, Very cool. and, and uh, comes Herb back. Orc and then sack it and it comes back because of the thing. So That's a great one. Yeah. Uh, and then there's an interesting kind of uh, interaction. It's fun. <laughs> yeah, it's cool. Which is, you know, red can make copies of creatures similar to, to blue. They're kind of the second best at cloning. But mm-hmm. what they do is they make like a temporary copy. Yeah, it gets haste and it and it's but it's just for this turn. Now, with legendary creatures, that's usually not very good because the legendary rule comes into effect and you have to sacrifice one of them. But with Orca, that means... kind of want it to die. Right, yeah. You, you make a temporary copy, you sack it, it gets its trigger, you deal five divided how you want, mm-hmm. and that's a creature dying, which puts one uh, a counter on the original. So these like temporary copy stuff is actually quite good, I think, with Orca and could be a way to really... like have a crazy explosive turn where it looks like you're not really a threat, you know, just orcas out by itself, maybe even. And yeah. you're like, all of a sudden I was able to make like three or four copies and, you know, deal a ton of damage and deal. Yeah. 15, 20 damage. Uh, blade of selves is really good at that. It gives the equipped, it's an equipment that gives the equipped creature myriad. So it'll oh, make man. two orcas, put two counters on the original one, deal 10. It's pretty good. And the main, the main one's still attacking. Yeah. It's pretty good. That's yeah. a, that's a big, a big life swing. Uh, some of these things, uh, I really like Molten Echoes because it's, again, it's in play before Orca yeah, comes yep. down. So you would name Demon. Uh, it's a four mana red enchantment that you would choose demons. And whenever a demon enters the battlefield, uh, it makes a temporary copy of a demon. So you cast Orca, make a copy, it dies, put a counter on it. And then if you can kill it again, you get another copy every time Orca enters the battlefield. That's pretty sweet. Yeah, because if you're doing the Kai's Ghost Form stuff. Yeah. All of a sudden, that could be really great. It's right? another Malachi Rebirth more that Kaya's Ghost Form it every time I'm getting two Orcas into play. Yeah, I mean, even so, if you have so, if you Molten Echoes Orca copy Malachi Rebirth, the original, sack the original to the legendary rule, put a plus one counter on the token, do five, you get the original plus a copy. Yeah, you get the original plus a copy, sack, sack, deal yeah. 11, put two counters yeah, on the thing. If you have original, enough, yeah. Like that's not that's a crazy. Cool leap. Yeah, it's only eight, but uh, it's only eight mana it's because you've already got molten echoes in in play and Malachi rebirth. Yeah, that's pretty cool. I think if you have a sack outlet out, I'm not actually super worried that Orca is the type of creature that they're going to want to remove right away. Yeah, um, and you also have a lot of um, negotiating power because if you play Orca for seven with a sack outlet out and pass turn, they don't really want to mess with it. No, right? If they go to path it, you're like, cool. I'm going to sack it. I'm going to that five damage is coming at something on your board. Right. Right. Because you you can point the damage anywhere at any target. Yeah. Which means you're killing something important, Mm -hmm. you know, hitting a planeswalker or doing something. Seaborn Muse. Yeah. And it's just as cards go, the Orca card is not likely to be something they're like, we must kill. They cannot untap with that. Yeah. So I think you actually will have a decent chance of playing Orca out and untapping with it and doing some of this stuff. Because even the stuff we're talking about is not like everybody dies, right? It's like you deal yeah. 30 damage. Yeah. Yeah. And you, so you can take out a problem permanence or or problem players uh, sort of all suddenly. It is it is going to be explosive, but it's not necessarily like the game's over in, yeah. unless you have an infinite combo or something like that. Which is nice. I think you will be able to get to do your thing because yeah. it's not super scary, provided you can get to the amount of mana or do some of that trick we were talking about where you get Orca into your hand early mm-hmm. or get into the graveyard. Um, and other things of those temporary copies could be like Splinter Twin, Heat Shimmer, Twin Flame. Yeah, all of those. Yeah, all of those. It's really pretty good. good. At that. Yeah. All right, on to the next one. We got a few left. We're getting towards the end. We got we're we're in the R's now, because uh, I th- said we were A through R, and we have three in the R category. 
And then I think there's even a couple more that will be on the next episode that are still ours. <laughs> this is how alphabetization, alphabetizing works. Okay, anyway. Ramirez DiPietro, Pillager, is next up. Two, a blue and a black. So four mana for a 4-3. Human Pirate. That's important. When Ramirez enters the battlefield, you lose two life and you create two treasure tokens. Pretty good. I'd only cast two mana then. Yeah. Whenever one or more pirates you control deal combat damage to a player, exile the top card of that player's library. You may cast that card for as long as it remains exiled. So there's a couple of rules notes we should say with Ramirez. The first off, that little clause where it says you may cast that card for as long as it remains exiled means that you can cast that card even if Ramirez is gone. So once Ramirez exiles a card, you have access to it. It's yours. Basically for the rest of the game. Yeah, it's like a Gaunti effect. Yep. Rule number two, you will note that Ramirez does not have the clause as though it were mana of any color, which means that when you cast that spell, you have to be able to create the correct colors of mana, kind of like send triplets. Yes. Uh, luckily, he helps you out a little bit with those treasure tokens. For sure. But you're going to need some additional fixing because hypothetically, you're going to be drawing a lot of cards. Yeah. Yeah. It's kind of like, it's not impulsive drawing. It's exile drawing. I don't even yeah, know what to call it. It's drawing drawing. Yeah. But the first category we have here is five color fixing because you will need this deck to be able to produce colors that are not in its color identity. And luckily, this is not a very difficult thing to do. Felwar Stone, City of Brass, Mana Confluence, more ways to make treasures. Uh, you wrote down Chromatic Lantern. You have to. You have to agree with this one. I agree with this. One. Even this one. I agree. This, with this one needs. <laughs> I agree with this one. They've heard me lately about that Painbow deck. Keep saying I wouldn't run Chromatic Lantern, and a lot of people got on me about that. But I would still not run it in that deck. But Ramirez and Send Triplets are special cases where it is actually a little bit difficult to create mana outside of your color identity. And the fact that, that this is like Chromatic Lantern just fixes that entirely. Yeah. Um, you're just makes it worth it for sure. Yeah. yeah. Luckily, uh, you're also playing pirates. So you're going to make a lot of treasures. Yep. This is part of the established tribal identity. Uh, so there is going to be a lot of treasures, which sack for all five colors. I don't think it'll ultimately be much of a problem if you just make sure that that's a part of your deck. Right. Because yeah. you can have a few lands that do it with man conferences and mm -hmm. stuff. And then, you know, you really only need a couple of ways because you're still going to cast some spells from your own hand. Yeah. And a lot of you, there'll be other players at the table that are sharing some colors with you. You won't need to, you know, make seven green on any given turn, but you will need to be able to make, you know, maybe two colors outside of your color identity on any given turn. Yeah. Also, you can focus your attacks if you don't have colors for another deck. Good point. Like good point. Yeah. Uh, OK, then, of course, Ramir's first ability is an ETB ability that makes treasures. So Blink Flicker, I think an obvious way to go to just kind of maximize treasure creation. Mm -hmm. Displacer Kitten. Gross. Oh, this card's so good. So you do have to be careful because yes. you do lose two life when Ramirez enters the That's battlefield. A good point. You can't go crazy yet. <laughs> you can still go kind of crazy. You can crazy. still go pretty crazy. You can so get, displacer, you life. Yeah, Displacer Kitten. <laughs> it, so it's a three and a blue for a two, two. Whenever you cast a non-creature spell, exile up to one target non-land permanent you control, then return that card to the battlefield under its owner's control. This card's ridiculous. Uh, we we find ourselves mentioning it quite a bit, which usually tells us that the card's very powerful. Um, obviously, it works here because you can blink, flicker, Ramirez, but man, just on like a Gilded Lotus or something, I've seen people do crazy stuff where there's like, cast this, this untaps, that untaps the thing, you know? Base, virtually untaps it, right? Because it exiles. Why does it have to say uh, non-land permanent? It should have said creature, right? You, you, it should say non-displacer kitten creature. Yeah, that's true. The fact then, that it protects itself, yep. that you can cast, that you can cast. All you need is a brainstorm, brainstorm yep. and blink display. Oh, you removed it? <laughs> no, you didn't. Why doesn't it return it at the end step? That would totally change it too. Like yeah? I think it would be fine. Like then you can't do the gilded lotus thing. But this, yeah, it's this, bananas. Yeah. This card's crazy. It's like especially with. Ramirez, it basically turns like any it it it, it, it uh, creates like a dead eye navigator mana thing because now now you have two mana that you can use to cast a spell, blink the thing, make more mana, blink yeah, the thing again. Yeah, if the thing you get off their deck is a non creature spell, you can keep moving. Yeah, then you just get to like blink Ramirez when you cast it to make the two more treasure. Yeah, it's pretty good. Of course, you can be sort of more fair and. Play Thos is deep dwelling and stuff like that. Mm -hmm. Siren's Ruse is a pirate specific. I love that one. Yeah. It's, it's also really good with this place. <laughs> yeah, it really is. It's an instant exile target creature you control, then return that card to the battlefield under its owner's control. If a pirate was exiled this way, draw a card. <laughs> so it seems pretty 
Pretty tailor-made for this deck. <laughs> Pretty good. Yeah, and then speaking of Deadeye Navigator, which you yes. just mentioned, Deadeye, Deadeye immediately goes infinite ETBs with, well, I'm going to say infinite. It goes as a, much life approximately as 20. <laughs> if you're out. Yeah, because remember, you lose the two life. But Deadeye gives the ability to blink Ramirez for blue one and blue. So that's the two treasures that Ramirez creates. So you go, Ramirez enters the battlefield, bank the two treasures, sack those two treasures to activate the ability... Blink it, blink it, blink it. Again, Dead I should have said until uh, or at the beginning of the next end step doesn't. Um, but that doesn't get you very like much, right? Because you're yeah. like, well, I paid two mana to get two mana. It's just infinite ETBs and you're losing life. Yeah. So, but you found a combo that got kind of add one piece and all of a sudden you win the game with this. So Nadir's Nightblade is an uncommon from Commander Legends. It says whenever a token you control, treasure token, leaves the battlefield, each opponent loses one life and you gain one life. So now every time you're sacrificing the treasure token, you're gaining the life back that you're losing to Ramirez and you're draining the table. Yep. So it gives you it gives you a way to win with just Dead Eye Navigator and Nadir's Nightblade. Congratulations, we broke Dead Eye Navigator. We did it. Who you remember when Dead Eye Navigator was like the boogie man? Boogie. And now we're like six mana. <laughs> it's like yeah, it's fine. Like it's good, but <laughs> it's, got it's not broken. Are Why yeah, exactly. Would we run Dead Eye Navigator. So true. Why would I pay mana to do that? Uh, uh, okay. I this is kind of silly, but I I thought this would be a fun deck to pair with Garuda, especially if you're doing blank stuff. Um, as a companion. As a companion? Yeah. Uh, you have to have only even? It's only even stuff in the, which is, is a cost and you can't, you can't run Chromatic Lantern. <laughs> but I like it, it already. <laughs> but it's, um, Garuda is a really cool ETB and you've got sort of these like mill, waves right? and water. It's mills and reanimate stuff. So it, it can go along with a blink. Then it's uh, the, thing. yeah, then it's the Davy or it's the, um, the Moby Dick. Yeah, right? yeah, it's, it's de- the definitely. Pirate and the, mon- <laughs> the pirate the sea and monster, yeah. <laughs> the Kraken. I think it's like a cool flavor build. <laughs> uh, of course, you can go Pirate Tribal and lean in that direction a little bit with this deck. So things, remember, you want to uh, attack your opponents and deal combat damage to them, right? It's combat damage? I believe right? so. Let me reread. Whenever one or more pirates you control, combat deal combat damage. damage to a player. That's when you exile the top card of that player's library and you can play it. Um so something like Changeling Outcast is really good because it is a one mana Changeling, which means it's a pirate and it can't be blocked and can't block. Um, Siren Storm Tamer is a flying one mana card. That's just also just a very good card mm-hmm. that gives you an early pirate, but you can sacrifice it to choose a target spell or ability your opponents can, or sorry, counter target spell or ability that targets you or a creature um, you control. So that is a relevant ability for later in the game. Um, Protect your combo pieces when it comes down. All of these evasive pirates are really good. So Departed Deckhand is great. Uh, it can't be blocked except by spirits. Uh, it also has a clause whenever it becomes a target of an ability, sacrifice it. So yeah. it can have a little bit of downside, but it does get through to get you some treasure tokens. Oh. Uh, or so, Excuse me, some card draw. But speaking of treasure tokens, uh, Malcolm, Keen-Eyed Navigator is going to be one of the first cards that you put in this deck. It's pirates oh, dealing combat, dealing damage. Excuse me, Malcolm's not even combat damage. Yeah. Um, and you get treasures. You get treasures. So it's your mana fixing. It's pirates energy. Malcolm's quite strong in here. Uh, Corsair Captain also has an ETB uh, make a treasure token. Yeah, it just pumps your pirate. says plus one, plus one. That too. Uh, Cover of Darkness was a card you brought up. I love this card. It's, I mean, it seems really good. It's gotten kind of expensive, but it's really good in a deck like this uh when it it's a two mana black enchantment when it enters the play choose a creature type pirate and creatures of the chosen type have fear which means they can't be blocked except for by artifact or black creatures so if you have your pirates on board now even if they don't have evasion like a corsair captain they do yeah and you, you know all you need is one of the opponents to not have a black creature or an artifact yeah. creature which because you just want to make sure you are getting access to some additional cards. Yeah, you yeah. want to want to be drawing cards uh, on that combat damage. Some other ways to get your pirates uh, through or take advantage of that pirate synergy. A haunted one is a really cool new one. It Love says commander creatures you own have whenever this creature becomes tapped. It and other creatures you control that share a creature type with it get plus two plus O oh and gain undying until end of turn. Really good with ETB stuff. Uh, if they die, they come back. Ugh, scary. Yeah, it opens up attacks you couldn't otherwise have because you don't care if they die. Obviously, yeah. it can affect all your pirates and just make them hit harder. 
some other stuff that I really like, especially if I'm in a black tribal deck, is uh, Haunted Voyage and Patriarch's Bidding. They kind of do the same thing, uh, but they you choose a creature type and they return that creature type from your graveyard to the battlefield. Yeah. Patriarch's Bidding brings everybody's back. Haunting Voyage, uh, you foretell to get the full effect. But um, We cover from a board wipe. Or- yeah, and I think your opponents are going to be like pretty interested in a board wipe. Um when you're getting that much card advantage and that much mana advantage. So uh, having a little bit of defense and protection is going to be really important. And you are sort of focused on sneaking in combat damage. So like Reconnaissance Mission, Grim Hireling. Grim Hireling is really good in this deck. You create treasures when you do combat damage, draw cards when you do combat damage. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And then, of course, there's this whole other aspect of the deck, which is you are playing your opponent's cards. And this is kind of a new tribal synergy, tribal, a new sort of, theme that yeah, we've seen yeah. kind of in the last couple of years Xanathar, Xanathar yeah. Tasha mm-hmm. um Tasha's that kind of pay you off for the amount of whenever you cast spells that your own, opponents own or how many permanents you control that they own that aren't your own yeah. yeah so Tasha brain stealer dragon there's some cards I think that are in that mold that might be worth a look as far as like oh I, I know I'm gonna have some amount of cards that my opponents own so if I can get some payoff synergies for that might be good for sure yeah all right uh Pretty cool, Ramirez, I think. I think he's cool. Yeah. Honestly, I'm pretty scared, scared if Ramirez is across the table for me because it could be anywhere from like Pirate Tribal, which will be which will be pretty fine, but compatible to very serious combo uh, with a lot of counter backup. <laughs> yeah, that's the thing is the deck probably plays a lot of interaction because you're going to rely on your opponent's deck for the more proactive stuff. Yeah. But if it's a Pirate Sinner or Pirate Tribal version, it's probably going to be a little less powerful than that. Right. Yeah. yeah. I like those decks, though, because, you know, it's hard for you to blame me for beating you with the cards. You you thought they were fine to put in your deck, yeah. so they should be fine for me to use against you. I agree. I think those are really fun. Uh, the next one is also a Demir tribal deck. It is Ramsey's Assassin Lord. Mm-hmm. Uh, for two, a blue and a black, he's a legendary human assassin. He's a 4-4 four, four with death touch that says other assassins you control get plus one, plus one. And whenever a player loses the game... If they were attacked this turn by an assassin you controlled, you win the game. It's one of these you win the game cards. Yeah, how do you feel when this card is in the command zone across from you, Jeff? I mean, scared. Yeah, definitely scared. Uh, I wanted to make a rules note here. The player does not have to die because of the assassin attack. So playing this commander probably requires a little bit of a real rule zero conversation as well. Um this is one of the first thing I think people brought up. I think the spike feeders and Jim uh, mm. previewed this card. So there's a kind of scummy thing I think that can happen. And you should just, if you're going to play Ramses, you should just have a discussion with the table first, because if the player's going to die mm. and you have attacked them with an assassin that turn, that's going to make you win the game. They could concede in which case they will not trigger the Ramses uh, clause there, mm. which I would consider to be kind of scummy. But I think it's just safe not to get in that situation. And just when you pull out Ramses, just be like, hey, listen, my commander only works if right. people uh, will stick around and die when, they're, when they would have died. Right. So all I'm going to ask here is that, you know, we make sure that concessions are going to be only, f- you know, are not going to be to prevent my win the game clause. Yeah. And I think a very clean way to say that is is a rule that we like to use in our, in our play group anyway, is just you can only concede at sorcery speed. Yeah. So you can concede on your turn if you're like, you know what? I do not have outs. I'm done. If and the that, stack is clear. If the stack is clear. Yeah. Because yeah. um, it's just that way you're not, there's no spite concessions. You're not conceding to like prevent an opponent from getting lifelink yeah. or something All like that. All that stuff like you shouldn't be doing, I don't think in general. I would no. encourage people not to do those things. Um, let the cards like determine things. But it's perfectly like you have to allow concessions, right? Because like my wife just got out of a car. I said, I got to go. Yeah. yeah. Concede the game. Get out of here. You know, oh, I have to be at a job interview or whatever. Like, you yeah. have to allow people to concede, I think, for realistic reasons. But, like, conceding to sort of deny an opponent some kind of an advantage, to, it, it kind of goes against the spirit yeah. of the game, I would say. For sure. So Okay, so how do you feel if you see Ramses across the table from you? It's tough. Because <laughs> you're like, as much as I want to root for Assassin Tribal, I have to believe that you're just trying to kill me in a way that's faster than Assassin's Tribal. Uh, so I'm pretty concerned about it. I like, I think you're going to have a tough time playing this deck at a table and having your opponents not be like, we're going to kill you for sure. Well, it feels like um, maybe we should have saved this discussion for the end of this, but I don't want to like poo poo the, the commander, but it feels like if I start hitting a different opponent, 
I'm helping the assassin player because the closer I get any one of my opponents to death that's not the assassin player, right. the closer I get them to just overall winning, not knocking out that player. Because if they can yeah. kill one player, they can win. And yeah. so I need to probably hit their Ramsey's player first because hitting them doesn't help them win. Whereas hitting right. the other two players helps them win, right? It also it also just sort of puts them on the same team because it says if one of us lose, all of us loses. Yeah. So you're just immediately starting the game from a three versus one perspective. And so I think if you're playing Ramsey's, you need you need to have a very explicit conversation beforehand and be like, look, I'm playing Assassin's Tribal or look, I'm trying to kill you and I am prepared to fight all three of you at once. I was going to say that might be a fun challenge. Yeah, for A lot of people kind of may, might like that kind of setup. I agree. Um, yeah. Okay, so I wanted to do the same thing for assassins that I did for archers because I was just yeah. like, how many assassins are there in Demir? And there are 59, so even less sure. even less than there are archers. <laughs> um, their identity is they tend to have either first strike or death touch. They rarely have both. They tend to have activated abilities that destroy creatures but have some sort of requirement, a condition that has to be met. So the classic is the original, which is Royal Assassin. Mm. Uh, you tap it to destroy target tapped creature. That's a very classic, and a bunch of them have some sort of variant of that. Um, but they they also do other things like they ETB and destroy a creature, like Necrotal does that. Yes. Yeah. yeah. Um, or they might have a different cost, like tap and sacrifice a creature, destroy target non-black creature, that stronghold assassin. There's a lot of like pay a cost, dist- the outcome is destroy a creature in yeah, some way. Usually they're killing something, which makes yeah. sense. Assassin. Yeah. They're 187 creatures, as we say. <laughs> um, so Assassin Tribal, if you're going to go that route, which I think we both believe is sort of the more fair, less powerful version of this. Yeah. You know, there's it might be a bit of a trap. There's not a lot of good assassins. Like there's yeah. 59 total that exist and most of them are bad. Most of most of them are bad. Yeah. Um, some really good ones are Massacre Girl, yep. who enters the battlefield and essentially wipes the board. As long as there's minus, a one one. Yeah, it gives minus one for each creature that dies that turn. Uh, Virtus the Veiled sees a lot of play. He's when he deals damage to a player, he halves their life total. Mari the Killing Quill is a new assassin. Kind of cool, actually. It's a legendary vampire assassin for one black black. It's a three two. It says whenever a creature an opponent controls dies, exile it with a hit counter on it. Assassins, mercenaries, and rogues you control have death touch. And whenever this creature deals combat damage to a player, you may remove a hit counter from a card that player owns in exile. If you do, draw a card and create two treasure tokens. So you're like removing creatures for money. It's uh, yep. You're getting uh, paid to kill creatures. A lot, a lot of flavor here. As assassins do. Yeah, very good. Like new <laughs> Capanna flavor. <laughs> on Mari the Killing Quill. So there is like some cool cards. Um, but past that. I mean, honestly, like we all we named almost all the good assassins already. There's like that's a, less it. than 12. Yeah. yeah. So you're either going to be sort of just drudging through, you know, the sort of lower powered stuff to kind of make it work. Or you're going to kind of have another piece of this plan that's not really relying on the assassins. And honestly, like. The only reason you want assassins, obviously it pumps all assassins, but yeah. the big thing you're looking for is when a player loses the game, if they were attacked this turn by an assassin you controlled, you win the game. So you need an assassin on the battlefield to attack someone before they die or to cause the death of so yeah. that you then win rather than only knock out one player. Mm-hmm. The thing is, Ramses already is an assassin. Yeah. So he, he can be the one. You don't have to play any other assassins. He can be the one assassin that sort of meets that criteria and you can win in other ways. So, of course, this requires Ramses to attack and live because if he's not around after the combat and then you, you know, exsanguinate or whatever. Yeah. Then, well, you won't win the game because he's not still around. Yeah, exactly. Mm -hmm. So there's a lot of ways, though, to get him through. Whisper Silk Cloak, Prowler's Helm. There's aura ways because you're in blue. Uh, Protective Bubble gives Unblockable and Shroud. (laughs) These are ways to just say, like, I can attack. Nobody, you know, nobody will be able to block. Yeah. And then I can sort of that'll I can check off the did I attack with an assassin part of my plan that I have to right. in order to now go to the real part of the plan, which is like kill that player in another way. Right. Um, yeah. Lots of lots of ways to protect. Uh, and if uh, and this is another good Malakir rebirth deck. Oh, yeah. Uh, oh, that's a really good point, because yes, you attack. Whatever they block and because it doesn't say deal combat damage, it just says yeah. attack. If but whenever dies, it died, now I'm Alakir rebirth it back and it's like I did attack with assassin this turn. 
That's good. He, they, they don't necessarily have to survive combat if you can get a feign death or a supernatural stamina. All of these have the, the same rough effect. Okay, uh, so then the question becomes, like, how do you KO the one player? You can get right. cute with it. You can. I... I love a murder weapon. Uh, I, I feel like this deck has to run Vorpal Sword, whether Vorpal Sword is good or not. It's not. Uh, I'm just going to say right now. <laughs> an artifact equipment for a single black. It says equipped creature gets plus two plus zero and has death touch. And then you may pay five. Oh, it's equip is black, black. That's fine. So it's black to cast, equip black, black. And then uh, you have to pay five black, black, black until end of turn. Vorpal Sword gains whenever an equipped creature deals combat damage to a player, that player loses the game. So it turns an equipped creature into Phage, which is also not a very <laughs> good card. <laughs> um, but it's a cute. I've died to a Vorpal Sword before. I've killed somebody with a Vorpal Sword so before. There you go. It does happen. It can. It can happen. You do need a lot of black mana. And um, a lot of protection. It's just usually. a lot of mana in general. So much mana. It's the most telegraph plan ever because you have Ramses, you play Vorpal Sword. Everybody knows what's trying to happen. Right. Here. So if you're going to cast, equip, and activate, you need black, black, black. You need black, 11 mana. Black, black, black. <laughs> and you already <laughs> have to have some black. way that it's unblockable. And it right. can't be Whisper Silk or something to give Shroud. Right. Yeah. Uh, so it's, that seems imminently fair. If you pull that yeah. off, congratulations. I will applaud you. Good job. Yeah. Uh, there's another one that has a sort of <laughs> so, uh, so I, I tail one Rick player. Evans you and Chuck both was down, and I'm like, there's no way this is. It. I've never seen I this happen. I have killed a full table with really. Rick Stadium. I've never seen yes, anybody do it anything. It was in a token it. deck, so it, okay. I, it you really need to deal a lot. You need a lot of creatures. <laughs> but Strixhaven Stadium says is a uh, three man artifact that taps for a co uh, colorless, and you put a point counter on Strixhaven Stadium. Whenever a creature deals combat damage to you, remove a point counter from Strixhaven Stadium. Whenever a creature control deals combat damage to an opponent put a point counter on Strixhaven Stadium then if it has 10 or more point counters on it remove them all and that player loses the game you're playing Quidditch basically you're playing Quidditch uh, so if you attack them with 10 assassins and they all deal combat damage right. you win the game you win the and, and you deserve you, it and then you beat the audience as well <laughs> for watching <laughs> <laughs> in a token deck it makes a little more sense yes you really need to be making a lot of bodies I think to do the Strixhaven Stadium plan and if that's your plan um, you need to be all in on the Strixhaven Stadium plan wow okay <laughs> hey at least you're in black you can tutor for it and yeah. blue blue can fabricate it or whatnot. yeah it gets artifacts yeah you can yeah okay there are easier ways to kill people in black believe it or not I think one of the ways you can kill people is with that attack with Ramses, though. And it doesn't have to be as obvious as Vorpal Sword. Mm -hmm. You know, Hatred comes into play again as yeah, a possible card great. that would work. Um, there's stuff like Howl from Beyond, which is similar to Hatred but costs mana. Mm -hmm. You could even, and, and you put this down and I agree, which is the Infect Poison plan might be one of the better ways to go here. I, I think that's the an interesting build to this deck. Um is 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 going with infect because it's like it's a very fast way to kill one player and it's on combat damage which is the deck already wants to do so a lot of the things are sort of working together on that um and I, blue I mean, black I'll infect is tough like yeah, yeah. green so you're it's a tough spot yeah as a person who's played a lot against craig the one thing i would say about craig when he's playing infect is he is very good at killing one player yeah and very bad at killing the other two players because by the time you've wasted the resources and the time, the other players have now set up and they know what you're doing. Right. Well, this kind of gets around that by being like, well, when I kill the one player, though, I win now because of my commander. So that is actually probably the perfect poison slash infect type of commander where it says, listen, you only need to kill one player. And the infect player is like, oh, I'm good at that. I can do that. That part's not that one hard. Yeah. Because just a pump spell and tainted strike will do it. Will do it. That's all you need. Yeah. And a lot of times you don't even need unblockable. You're just doing that at a point where like you're putting a big question to the player you're attacking because you're like, yo, I got a 4-4 with death touch coming in at you. Yeah. Do you want to block with your value creature? And a lot of people are going to be like, no, I'll yeah. take I'll take the chance. And you go, cool. Pump spell, tainted strike. I win. Yeah, I, I think that's actually a really fair way to build oh, yeah. Ramses because it is combat based and it is so projected and it's like, it's hard. You have to get your commander in play. You have to get four to 10 power and get it. In fact, it's not that hard to get that four to 10 if you are willing to just use all your resources all your and go for it. Do it. But you can still hold up your force of will, your fierce guardianship. So yeah. It could be pretty well protected. I don't think it's CDH because you have to get an attack off, but that can happen yeah. on turn three. Maybe turn four. Like you cast Ramsey on turn three. On turn four, you untap. You have an yeah. infect grantor and something that pumps it. 
I don't think that's crazy. Another way that you could do this one shot kill is to get their power over 21 and just go straight commander damage. Sure. Um, so it is like if you want to do blue black Voltron, I think Ramses is another way to do that. Of course, it's twice as much as in fact, but you right. don't have to focus on the in fact pieces as much. Um, you OK, uh, you can also just go for the traditional ways I, I sort of talked about exsanguinate already, but Torment of Hailfire is another way. Mm-hmm. Those often kill all the players by the time you cast them. Yeah. But you most uh, most of the time, I think there's probably a player that you could get to a little earlier if you knew you only had to kill one of them. But you yeah. just kind of hold and try and get everybody at once. So there might be a point in the game where you're like, well, if I cast Exsanguinate, it will definitely kill this player. So I just attack them with my Ramses and then do it and now win the game. Whereas mm-hmm. I, to get the Exsanguinate big enough to kill everybody, I would have had to like jump through some more hoops or get some more mana. This deck is interesting because it does really encourage you to focus on the player who's most behind. Yeah. Which is often goes against uh, a natural commander game. That's you're interesting. Like, Are you straggling? I'm go- you're going to die. But what's going to happen in that case is the other two players are likely to help to protect the them. struggling player. Yeah. Yeah. It does create a very interesting social dynamic in, yeah. in the game, but you do have to be prepared to be ganged up upon, which means you need counterspells. Uh, you're going to need a lot of protection for your plan. Uh, yep. Basic counterspells. I wouldn't even run like Arcane Denial. Like just no... no you like you need to be able to swan song and, dispel you know yeah. the zero mana ones mana drain if you can this deck is going to get targeted by the whole table yeah i think yeah. people should just know that going in if yes. i if i get emails or tweets from people being like well, everyone just doesn't let me do my thing with my ramsey's deck i'm gonna be like yo you're playing ramsey's like you just asked for it it says it on the card yeah your thing is to kill the table yeah. and it says that yeah uh, you have to expect that people are smart enough to try not to die all right we got one more left I know you're excited about this one, so oh, yeah. I'll let you read it. <laughs> also has a lot of words. It does have a lot of words. <laughs> the last one is Rasputin, the Oneromancer. For one, a white and a blue. This is a 4-1 human wizard. When he enters the battlefield, you put a dream counter on it for each opponent you have. Each opponent creates a 1-1 red goblin creature token. So he ETBs, you put three counters on it, and all your opponents get a goblin. <laughs> And you can tap it to remove one or more dream counters from Rasputin and add that much colorless mana. Or you can tap it and remove a dream counter from Rasputin to create a 2-2 white knight creature token with protection from red. How often are you making a knight with this? Um, there's probably some combo-y stuff you can do. But probably. But not that often. You're, you're, uh, you know, I like mana and I like doing yeah. big splashy things and probably trying to create even more than the three mana in turn is probably one of the things you're trying to do. Um, you said Oneromancer as if that was a real word that you know what it was. I, uh, I just like a mancer. Okay. I was like, cause when you said it, I was like, oh, that's awesome. Cause oh, I have, I, romance? I had no way, I had no knowledge of how to pronounce that. Speak confidently and carry a big word. But then I was like, maybe she knows what that means, but no. No, oh, okay. I mean, right. I, I'm sure get in the comments and say what Onero is Latin for or whatever they, maybe it's dream. Oh, maybe it has to do a sleep or dream. I know the original Rasputin is Rasputin Dreamweaver. Yeah. So they love a mancer in uh, they in, do. <laughs> in Studio X. <laughs> uh, so a lot of a lot of people uh, look at this guy and see Blink Tribal, right? I know why you like this card. It just occurred to me it, because it gives creatures <laughs> to other players. I just like bingo. I get it. I mean, I read this card. I'm like, this card's bad. This card does not seem good. It's it's got cool things going on. It gives your yeah. cr- gives red goblins to your opponents and then it creates things with protection from red yeah. and i don't understand the flavor of the dream and the turning the dream into mana and the dreams being goblins or knights i have they, no idea is I, it like fairy tales or something i don't know what the goblins and knights are about i think the goblins are so you can't just go immediately go infinite with a haste enabler but um because you're giving you're giving your opponents stuff but right. I, and i guess it can block a 4-1 so you can't you can't attack <laughs> oh it's true it is a 4-1 i didn't even yeah, think about it it's not a very it's not really going to battle very much um so okay but it's interesting i don't know what the flavor is there all right so i put down the question of what's the plan question mark because i had no idea looking at the card so I, and then you came up with a plan. So I'll, uh, yeah. So I think there's I think there's two plans for this. It's okay. it's use them to get a big thing into play as fast as possible. Um, is so is like one the next them. turn you're like I cast a seven drop. Yeah. Something. Like I, you slam like you ramp really hard and and get omniscience into play. Or you're like you know what I've oh, got to turn four uh, consecrated sphinx or something like that. Okay. Uh, but my plan is to give opponents a lot of goblins. <laughs> His felder griff. 
Yeah, so you said give opponents even more creatures. Yeah, so you can use cards like Hunted Phantasm, which ETPs and gives away more uh, goblin tokens, five, five. red goblin tokens, yep. and you get a four, six unblockable for your trouble. Uh, Pursued Whale, when it ETPs, it gives everybody a little Captain Ahab, a red pirate token. Yeah, Moby Dick's coming up a lot. It this, yeah. is <laughs> coming up a lot. And then it, that'll be like a, a blinky flicker deck. So you're like, okay, I'm reusing the ETB to give away as many goblins tokens as possible. And you Using the mana from it to... And using the mana to cheat some of the, you know, Pursued Whale or some of your big, silly cards into play. Yeah, you have to remove the dream counters to get some to mana. Do, yeah, you have, to, that's why you have to blink him. It's just so you crazy. You get more dream counters on him, Josh. <laughs> you need the dream counters. You gotta live the dream. To live the dream. <laughs> <laughs> it's like so bad. Like you can't just tap for the mana. You have to remove the counter so you can't even do it again until no. you do something else. Well, he has dream. His old version has dream counters on it. Yeah, yeah. And you can remove. But the I'm just saying, like counters. they were like, no, this thing needs another downside. You have to give creatures to your opponents for this mana dork that has a limited amount of times yeah. so you can use it. Yeah. Yeah. That seems nuts. Okay. It's so. So, so what do you do once you? All right, fine. Let's say you accomplish your goal. Yeah, I think I already know the answer because I've been on the receiving yeah, end. But yeah. like, okay, you've given a bunch of creatures to your opponents. Mm -hmm. Now what? Uh, okay. Now you punish your opponents for having creatures. <laughs> First you give them the creatures, then uh, and then you, you make you, the money. <laughs> you teach them <laughs> that creatures are in fact bad. Uh, with silly spells like Dingus Staff, it says whenever a creature is put into a graveyard. Of course, this plan play. would have the word Dingus in it. I love it. <laughs> uh, dingus Staff deals two damage to that creature's controller. If your goblins take good care of your goblins because they're going to shock you on their way out. Um, oh, so you're like, haha! You thought you wanted ten goblins? And no, instead you don't. Uh, yeah, okay. take ten. <laughs> Uh, are you skull clamping them? Shoot. Uh, uh, but you can also punish them on ETPs with stuff like Soul Warden or uh, Sutra Priest is a very clean mm -hmm. one. It's whenever a uh, cre whenever another creature enters the battlefield under your control, you may gain one life. Whenever a creature enters the battlefield under an opponent's control, you may have that player lose one life. So Rapid Sputin becomes uh, deal one damage to each opponent when... When he ETBs. And now you just have to figure out how to infinitely flicker him. Right. It's easy. Okay. It's easy. Uh, and this one, this one's too mean for even Feldergriff. I took this one out, but it's cool. It's a, a six man artifact called Ward of Bones. It says each opponent who controls more creatures than you can't play creature cards. <laughs> the same is true for artifacts, enchantments, and lands. Yeah. So if you can gum up their board with goblins, they cannot cast real creatures. <laughs> which They're like, is okay, this is all I have. Yeah. And I can't cast more. So, so you cast Resputin on three. You give everybody a goblin. Then you tap him. You or, and you cast a ward of bones immediately. And then you flicker them a couple and times. You flicker them like, a couple times, and you're like, They're like, I can't place things. What am I doing with all these goblins? And they have to figure out how to get rid of them. Are they then, just attacking you with them? And you're like, I make a knight. Ha. Ha ha. Except for I'm out of dream counters. Yeah, well. <laughs> <laughs> you probably want propaganda and stuff, I guess. You're gonna want you're gonna want a couple of ways to uh, not die to these goblins for sure. This one had a question mark on our notes. I want to read it. Oh, it's sweet. Mocking it's cool. Doppelganger. It's three and a blue for a flash zero zero shape sister. You may have it enter the battlefield as a copy of a creature an opponent controls, except it has other creatures with the same name as its creature are goaded. So this is pretty cool as far as like you give enough goblins to them and then you go to all the goblins. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, so and you're in a flicker deck, a, so you can flicker it. So you can flicker it and reset it. You're like, oh, I don't want to be hit by that. I'll I'll blink it and uh, and reset. Or just it, be but. like the goblins have to attack each other every turn. Yeah, and then they're dying, and then the dingus staff. It's all coming it's together. It's all coming together. Um, there's other ways to get rid of all the goblins. You can d cast something like a detention sphere, which will remove all of the goblins in yeah. one fell swoop. <laughs> yeah, I was, I was, we moved on here to, you don't have to just, like, play cards that punish them for having creatures. You could yeah. have, like, the alternate plan of, like, yes, I'm going to give them goblins, but I've got a bunch of cards in my deck that make those goblins just you know, easy to kill or worthless. Not a problem. Yeah. yeah. Detention Sphere gets rid of all things of the same name, basically. Mm -hmm. And yeah. it's an O-ring, but they will never come back because they're tokens. Right. Uh, Caltrops says whenever a creature attacks, it deals one damage to it. So it makes them not be able to attack. Light Minefield, very similar. Mm -hmm. Propaganda, Propaganda goes to prison. prison. Teferi's Moat is Teferi's pretty cool. Moat is a neat one that I used to run in Feldegrip. This is a, an enchantment for three white blue. When it enters the battlefield, uh, 
choose a color, creatures of the chosen color without flying can't attack you. So if you choose red, no red creatures on the battlefield can attack you. And there's some added bonus because there's going to be some other red creatures on yeah. the battlefield too. And it's also right. just useful if your plan's not really started and there's just something scary. Just like, okay, yeah, just blue. I just don't want that thing. To no, you yeah. go elsewhere with that. There's like Crovax, uh, Ascendant Hero, which is six mana for a four, four. It says other white creatures get plus one, plus one. Non-white creatures get negative one, negative one. So it just kills all the goblins when it comes out. Yeah. Kind Elishorn of like a cheap Elshorn. Yeah. 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 Elshorn would be awesome, one. but it's a lot more mana. Mm. Um, Crafty Cup Purse was put down here, which is three and a blue for a flash creature. When it enters the battlefield, each token that would be created under an opponent's control this turn is created under your control instead. So if you have enough mana, which is possible, I think, when you're flickering, mm. If, like, let's say you knew you could flicker Rasputin a couple times in a turn. Yeah, I mean, if you have Displacer Kitten and a Haste Enabler, yep. you can you can make a ton of goblins because it's three goblins every time he enters the battlefield. And you could even do that on an opponent, like the end step before your turn. So you might be able to go Crafty Cuts Purse, now flicker Rasputin a few times, tapping him in between. Mm. Goblins coming under my opponent's control actually come to me and mm. I make, you know, 12, 15 more or more goblins on my own side of the battlefield now. That's cool. Yeah. Uh, there's also some cool things that you can do with proliferate um, to m get more dream counters on him. If you want, if you want him to tap for more than three mana, um, you can use things like flux channeler that says whenever you cast a non-creature spell, proliferate. Um, there's a couple of draw spells that do this as well. Tezzeret's gambit draws two cards and proliferates. Uh, Inexorable tide says whenever you cast a spell, proliferate. Um, so you can get a bunch of counters on this with stuff like Deep Glow Skate that doubles the number of counters on it. Something interesting uh, is Panharmonicon doubles the trigger when yeah. it enters. So if you get Panharmonicon underneath uh, Rasputin, it'll enter with six dream counters and your opponents will each get two goblins. Yeah. So. But I think that's fine for you. If you're not yeah. scared of three goblins, you're not yeah, scared of two. Six mana. Nabon is the wizard version of that, but Rasputin mm -hmm. is a wizard. I was thinking in the midst of this because of the proliferate stuff that Intruder Alarm might interact interestingly in here yeah. where you you might start to make knights. So, yeah. yeah, if Intruder Alarm means that when a creature enters the battlefield, you untap all creatures, including your opponent. So be careful with the card. But if you have that out, you Rasputin, tap it, make a knight. That's a creature entering. will untap, untap Rasputin. And so if in there you can proliferate or whatever to the point where... You might either be able to keep that going or just like we always say, you don't have to go infinite. You can just go a lot. So if you manage to get deep glow skate, somehow get 10 counters on our spew and 10 knights might be kind of good. So yeah, they're protection from red. Yeah. So, yeah, which means they also can't be blocked by the goblins, which is nice. Yes. Yeah. I think once you get sort of the Rasputin thing going, what he really does sort of on the simplest side is just give you a lot of mana. He right? just makes you a big. Yeah. So then it just becomes a question of like, what are the big spells, the big dreams that we want to have here? Yeah. And we've already mentioned Elish Norn, I think is a good one. Omniscience. Huge. You know, probably the main one you want to go for. Big Eldrazi. Mm -hmm. They're you know. colorless too. It only makes colorless mana. So you do have to be careful about some of these spells with all, all of the pips in it. Yeah. People were talking about like you can get uh, like the dream trawler and stuff down quickly. But that is so many colored pips. Yeah. Raspberry doesn't even help you cast that because it's white, no, white, blue, blue. Yeah. Right? You so, really yeah. want big colorless yeah. spells. Old I mean, Breacher Horror is another one mm -hmm. that's just like, you know, you add a couple of blue mana, but Raspberry pays for the, the bulk of it. Yeah. Um, but there's a lot of big, powerful permanents that you can put into play, especially uh, if you have flicker abilities or if you can put it back in your hand and, and start recasting it. So um, it, it tends to it can look kind of like a worse spell B deck, uh, which reduces the casting cost of stuff based on the number of like yeah. the amount of damage your opponents have taken. But I think the Bell B deck requires a little bit more work, whereas Rasputin, yeah. you play it. Next turn, it's giving you three mana on like that is yeah. the the lo lowest case scenario. Like right. the the absolute floor is that you just don't have any trickery going on with goblins. You you're not dingus egging or sorry dingus staffing or whatever else. Dingus, uh, dingus egg, egg is, is a, a real card. card. It yeah. is a card. But it has to do with lands. Um, but you're still like I'm casting a seven drop on turn four. Yeah, you know, or maybe even on turn three if I no two two three. Okay, it's hard. You have to have a soul ring or something. But that's. That can be a big game if that seven drop is not something that if they kill it, you lose all the value off it. If it had an right. ATB effect or it's a consecrated Sphinx was a great example, great right? Because you're going to have at least drawn two cards, even if they kill the Sphinx, untap and kill it. And that's early to be dealing with something of that size. And that's kind of right. what Belby does as well. So 
yeah, that, that could be very powerful. If you can get enough enough value in those early turns, um, it, it can be really good. Uh, there, there yeah, you is, had a combo that you found here. Oh, yeah, it's a good one. It's another sort of three-card combo, but it's not yeah. crazy. It's not It's not crazy. Because all these cards go in the deck. Right. Uh, it does require a haste enabler, so something like Thousand Year Elixir is perfect. Um, but you want that card in the deck regardless. This doesn't right. require you to put anything in that only works in the combo. Right. Um, so... If you have a thousand year elixir in play, you can use an Eldrazi Displacer to uh, use the three colorless mana that Rasputin naturally makes, and you can blink Rasputin, put more counters on it, and use that mana to blink it again. While that's happening, you're giving your opponents goblins each time, so you can use a Suture Priest just whenever a creature enters the battlefield under their control to drain them out all of the way. So that's a three. I just card, realized. Card commi- yeah, you actually need standard. one more because uh, Eldrazi Displacer returns to the battlefield tapped. Does it? Yeah, so you have to... Uh, oh, you also need... <laughs> now you need a true arm or something, I suppose. Mm-hmm. Yeah. <laughs> Emulate bigger. <laughs> okay, so you untap it. You have a proliferate when it comes in. There you go. <laughs> I Every time you cast it, a... Like that. Yeah, I, Hilarious. I just read it and was like, oh yeah, I forgot about not that. Not quite. Not quite. <laughs> I mean, that Deadeye that, that, Navigator in there somewhere, that kind of idea yeah. could could work in some way. And, and not going infinite is fine, just might make it so that you can just sort of do it a lot of times. Yeah, for sure. So, yeah. All right. Uh, that is going to do it for the first 10 box toppers. Uh, a brisk couple of hours here. Oh I gosh, hope that, yeah. uh, thanks for sticking with us, everybody. A lot of really fun stuff, though. I think that's what it is, like, why these are sort of taking a while is because each commander feels like a full meal. It doesn't feel like... Yeah. Like, we didn't have one, I think, out of these 10 that was like, well, there's not much to say. Yeah. They're... And they're not related to the set, so they each have their own sort of individual thing going on. I, I think this this cycle has been really unique and very, very cool to see. Yeah, a lot of really cool stuff. All right. We always like to wrap these up, Rachel, by asking two questions. And the first one is, what is your favorite commander from the ones we talked about in this episode? Like, if you were going to build one of these 10, what are you most excited about? Uh, I'm definitely most excited about Hazizan Shaper of Sand. Oh, wow. I thought it was going to be Rasputin. Is it too, is that too much like a deck you already uh, yeah, have? Yeah, that, that, that smells like Feldegrim. Maybe okay. we'll go in the 99. Okay. <laughs> um, I, I really like a landfall deck. I don't have one that's really suited me. And I like that this one's is sort of narrow and not as like, you can do some unique stuff with it. Yeah. Cause so of the I, desert. Cause of the sword. desert thing. And, uh, yeah. And all the new white cards. I think general Marhalt L's dragon was mine. Yeah, it's cool. It seems like a cool deck. I don't think it's going to be super, super powerful, but you get to play a lot of cards that like you would never play in any other deck, which I always think is kind of cool. Yeah, for sure. What do you think is the most powerful commander from the 10 that we talked about today? Like just pure, if built as most optimized. I mean, we know that that commanders that cheat things into play and give you card advantage are extremely powerful in this format. And I think Aisha uh, Tanaka is is gonna top the list for me also just blue white combo artifact decks have a lot of support and have shown to be really powerful in the past yeah i agree uh, that is what i put down as well i think that that deck build as most optimal will be a house yeah we already know what note is really good it's not the exact same thing but artifacts by themselves are great and just okay now you can cheat the cost of them seems like it'll be decent. very good all right to the listeners what new commanders out of this bunch are you the most excited to build what sweet tech do you see that maybe we missed or did not mention please let us know in the comments twitter etc and of course if you want to build any of these decks well you're going to need to get the cards for them the best place to get your cards is channelfireball.com slash command their marketplace really does have everything you need they're all licensed businesses all lgs's this channel fireball vetted all their vendors which means you're supporting lgs's when you use it you're also getting the cards you want they're really good with sealed product too because they are businesses they go through the wn to get good sealed product uh prices so if you're looking for these box hoppers well you're going to have to order like a draft booster box or a set booster or collector's booster or you can just order the single, which is probably the smart way to go. Let's all be honest. Channelfireball.com slash commander. You can use code command at checkout. And of course, when you get those cards, keep them protected. Ultra Pro is the game accessories brand that we use on our very own collections here at the Command Zone. Jimmy and I have all our stuff in Ultra Pro products because it really does protect all of your game pieces. Clip sleeves, satin towers, play mats. I also love that Ultra Pro has a bunch of sort of other products like wall scrolls. We have wall scrolls all over our our building because they just kind of like spice up the environment. Uh, Their Eclipse dice are really, really nice. And I found them to be be great. We've been playing. You play a lot of spell table games. Yeah, Yeah, you're on streams and stuff all the time. We've been playing spell table with our patrons a lot. And I really like I found that like a lot of fancy dice that I had just don't read very well on those cameras. What you want is clarity and the Eclipse dice. dice. (laughs) Yeah, they're just like solid color. 
mm-hmm. you know, white number. You can very easily read it. And I found those to be really, really nice for like spell table games and stuff. So Ultra Pro just making whatever you need to play Magic. They've got you covered. Uh, all right. We're going to skip the end step on this one because it's been super, super long. And we've got <laughs> 10 more to talk about on the very next God. episode. Uh, we've already started the research. That's going to be out uh, pretty soon. Rachel, just want to say thanks for coming in and helping thanks us out. Thanks for having me. Yeah, we really so appreciate fun. it. So Rachel will be back uh, for the next few episodes here talking about Dominaria United. And uh, it's always great to get an outside perspective. Big thanks to our amazing team here at the Command Zone. Damon Lenz, Ashlyn Rose, Craig Blanchett, Arthur Meadowcroft, Lady Danger, Manson Lung, Josh Murphy, Jake Boss, Patrick Nan, Jordan Pridgen, Sam Waldo, Grove, Grilotti, Jimmy Block, Mitch Trafford, Evan Lindberger, and shout out to Truck Tie for the research help on this episode and most of our set reviews. And of course, special thanks to Jeffrey Palmer makes the living card animations that often sit behind us, although I think Sam made this one, uh, but they also start our show. Rachel, before we go, where can everybody find you on the interwebs? Yeah, I'm on uh, Twitter and Instagram at Rachel Reeks. I also have a commander podcast called The Commander Sphere uh, with my co-host Dan Sheehan. That's a very comedy focus, tends to be super silly. I also play uh, D&D with a group of comedians every Monday at 7 p.m. Pacific. That show's called Better Than Heroes. It's really hard to not run into Rachel if you're on the in the magic like <laughs> community all online. You definitely will run into her there. So, Yep. All right. Thanks again, Rachel. Thanks everybody for watching and we'll see you next time. Peace. For further inquiries, send an email to commandcast at rocketjump.com or ask us on Twitter at JF Wong and at Josh Lee Kwai. See you later, alligator. Greetings, humans. <laughs>